Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, June 18th, 2017. Jason Snell is hosting for me. I'm still on vacation. Episode 1397. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash techguy. And by Wistia, the video hosting platform that powers creative communication for more than 300,000 businesses. Start your free account today at wistia.com. And by Texture. Access the world's most popular magazines anytime, anywhere using your smartphone or tablet. Try it free for 14 days at texture.com slash twit. It's the tech guy. Leo Laporte is normally here. I am Jason Snell. I'm sitting in for Leo, who is wending his way back from a fantastic vacation south of the equator. I think he saw some turtles in the Galapagos. Maybe he'll have some tales to tell about how how he and his tech survived that long journey uh, across the water, and then in a, in in a bunch of plane rides. And he probably had to bring some power adapters. There's a lot of good tech stories I find that come out of travel. Anyway, again, my name is Jason Snell. I spent more than a decade as the editor in chief at MacWorld. You can uh, read what I write at sixcolors.com. I mostly write about Apple stuff, but I try to ha- take a broader view as well. I host a bunch of podcasts on Relay FM. You can get there at relay.fm and a bunch more at theincomparable.com. And I'm going to be holding down the fort today for Leo. I'll tell you one of the things that I am uh, really good at talking about is Apple stuff. Um, and they're, one of the things I'm really bad about talking about is helping you with your Windows problems. So please, if you have Windows problems, I beg you, um, if you call, you will be calling to commiserate, but I'm not sure I'll be able to help you other than I'll do the basics. I'll say you can turn it off and back on. Uh, that, that works with almost every technology, I find, uh, a, a lot of the time. And the number, I should remind you, is 888-8-ASK-LEO. Leo is not here, but... His name remains on our phone number. Now, this 8888 Ask Leo, I am told by the staff. I did say four eights, though. Just as long as there are four eights followed by Ask Leo, you'll be okay. And it's a toll free number where that is available. Uh, this week, a bunch of stuff happened. I know that Leo likes to talk a little bit about the week that was before taking some calls. And I, I'm going to try to do that. I'm, I am wearing Leo's shoes. They are a little bit loose. Uh, I hope I can fit into them. Uh, one of the things that happened this week, and I am going to talk about Apple a little bit because that is something that I, I focus on. Apple's big developer conference it was in San Jose, California last weekend or last week. And this week, the iPads that were announced at that conference arrived in stores. So you saw your first reviews on all the big websites on Monday. On Tuesday, Apple stores started to take shipment of these brand new iPads. And if you don't know what was going on with the iPad, I'll give you a little overview. There is a new iPad Pro 12.9. That is the giant iPad. It's the biggest iOS device ever made. And there's now a new 10.5 inch iPad Pro that is taking the space previously held by the 9.7 inch iPad Pro. Now, I know that these are a lot of numbers, these inches that that uh, I'm describing, which are diagonals, because we've still uh, we're still using the way we measure television sets to measure computer screens now, which seems weird to me, but that's that's where we are. The the classic iPad, the one that Steve Jobs unveiled in 2010, that was a 9.7 inch diagonal display. And although a lot has changed, they're a lot thinner and lighter now. They've got the Retina display, so they're a much higher resolution display than they were. That has always been the classic iPad size. And so this new iPad the iPad Pro 10.5 is displacing the 9.7-inch iPad Pro. It's a big step for Apple. There's still a 9.7-inch iPad. It's the classic iPad. They reintroduced the iPad fifth generation earlier this uh, this year in the spring. 
And that's still available, and that is the low-cost iPad. And it, it doesn't have any really cutting-edge technology in it, but it works pretty well. It's a great value. And on the iPad Pro side, what they've decided to do is make that screen a little bit bigger, but they've cut the bezel a lot around the display. Now, the bezel, if you don't know, again, industry term, a lot of uh, people don't know it. The bezel is that frame that goes around the display that you can actually see that's still on the face of your device. And the big trend in technology these days is to make those bezels smaller and smaller because although they're very convenient for you to hold the device, they're great because they allow the, uh, the wiring and, uh, and other things to be fit behind and beside the display, they do take make, make the devices have to be larger. So with the 10.5-inch iPad Pro, Apple has really reduced the size of that bezel, very much in the same way that what you saw with the new Samsung Galaxy uh, phones and uh, the new uh, Google Nexus, or uh, Google, uh, what is it called, Pixel phone. This is a big trend to get rid of bezels in all these displays um, on mobile devices. So the new iPad isn't that much bigger than the old iPad Pro, but it does have a bigger screen. And the big story is that Apple has done some pretty amazing things on the technical side. These displays refresh at 120 hertz. Again, sounds like a nerdy term, a little bit like back when we talked about display resolution when everybody got a high-resolution display. But it is something you can see. These these have not only uh, great, they're incredibly bright and super colorful, but the uh, increased uh, refresh rate means that animations are super smooth. Everything feels smooth. When you scroll, uh, you may not notice on your current device that things are a little bit uh, jumpy when you scroll. You may just take it for granted that that's how life is. Then you see one of these and you go, oh no, <laughs> this is much better. And it's it's kind of hard to go back to the one that you had before. So anyway, these are both out now. They have faster processors as well. They are definitely targeted at a higher end market than the than the uh, regular old iPad is. They are available with smart keyboards, which are these keyboard covers that Apple makes. These definitely Apple's answer to something like the Surface the from Microsoft. The big difference being that Apple has still got this two pronged strategy where you can buy a Mac or you can buy an iPad. And if you buy an iPad, you can't do what a uh, what you can on a Surface. Surface, which is kind of go from tablet mode into full-on laptop mode where you're running Windows applications, which you can when you're uh, when you're using a Surface. You can't get to the Mac from an iPad, and you can't get to an iPad mode from a Mac. They stay separate. And I think there are a lot of logical reasons for both companies to behave the way they do. But if you're somebody who wants, who kind of likes the idea of a tablet like an iPad Pro, but you can't see giving up the desktop experience, at least some of the time, in your mobile device... It's going to be a harder sell. It just is because Apple, Apple wants you to go kind of all in on iOS if you're going to use this as a professional device. And maybe you've got a Mac somewhere else. That's actually what I do. But Apple kind of wants you to go all in. So it's an interesting little step forward for Apple. We'll see how well it does. iPad sales have been pretty much down for the last few years. Apple's trying to build a market. They've had some success in the enterprise side and big businesses buying iPads. Uh, but we'll, we'll see if it taking the product a lot more seriously than it used to the last couple of years and making this iPad Pro line. the um, I should mention, too, the Apple Pencil, which Apple introduced last year, is... Uh, unchanged, but the higher resolution to screen, uh, higher uh, refresh rate on these displays means that when you're writing on them with an Apple Pencil or drawing, uh, artists have uh, reported that there's much less lag. Basically, it feels more natural. When you move your pencil on the screen, you see what's being drawn without uh, without any lag. In fact, it makes some guesses about where your pencil is going and displays those for you, which is really interesting to try and uh, create the illusion that you're basically putting pencil or ink down on a piece of paper. It's not all the way there yet, but Apple and Microsoft with their tablet products are both really pushing this forward. It's really interesting to see. There's a lot else going on in the tech world. E3 was this past week, and that's the Electronic Entertainment Expo. So if you're a fan of video games, even if you're not a hardcore gamer, there's some news out of that. There's a new version of the Xbox that's been souped up. Uh, the, the king of the hill right now is the PlayStation 4 console, and Sony showed off a whole bunch of games that are going to be coming in the future. And I think one of the more interesting things for me was to see Nintendo, which just released its new console, which is also kind of a handheld gaming device. It's both called the Nintendo Switch. You can play it by holding it in your hands, but you can also uh, plug it into a dock and 
detach the controllers and play it on your TV, just like it was a, a regular old console. The problem with the Switch has been that it launched with very few games. There were a handful of games for it. And so this last week, Nintendo made a lot of announcements about what's next for the Switch, uh, what's coming down the pike. And it's more information about the new Mario game, which is a almost a Grand Theft Auto-like open-world game. It's not like a uh, regular Mario game at all. It's very impressive uh, looking. And a bunch of other games, too. There's a Yoshi game and a Kirby game. And Nintendo doing what Nintendo does best, which is filling their brand new console with a whole bunch of games starring characters that a lot of people grew up with. I didn't. I actually am a little late to the Nintendo party, but... You know, it was in the ballpark for, uh, and, and, and so many people I know love Nintendo. Anyway, we'll be back in a little bit and take your calls. 8888 Ask Leo. See you soon. It's the tech guy. I am not Leo Laporte. I am Jason Snell sitting in for Leo. You can give us a call 8888 Ask Leo. I am definitely somebody who's got Apple on the brain, a lot of going on with Apple these days. So it's worth uh, thinking about what. Uh, what questions you might have about Apple for me. Uh, we're going to take some calls, but of course we should say hello to Kim, our call screener. As always, she's going to save me. Hi, Kim. <laughs> good morning. Thank you for saving me. Uh, I will do my best. It's uh, it's good. You having a good day? Uh, it's it's a scorcher out there. It is. <laughs> it's nice to be in the air conditioning. We, but... we poor Northern Californians with our uh, insensitivity to heat, but we've got it now. Uh, so <laughs> We've got a lot of heat today. Well, we got a lot of calls too, don't yeah, we? Yeah, we do. And uh, one of Leo's favorite things to do is spend other people's money. So oh, yeah. I think you're going to help Mike in Maine get an iPad, but he just doesn't know which one to get. I'm looking forward to that. Let's go to Mike in Maine. Hello. Mike. Hi, Mike. You're just the man I needed to talk to. You can help maybe help me spend some money, although as little as possible, obviously. I am in your court here. What, what's the uh, what's the issue? What do you have? Well, I'm uh, I, I'm I've, I've been a Windows person all my life. I still am, except I've had an iPhone, a 6S, for about 18 months, and it works great for me. I'm very very happy with it. You know, a few glitches here and there, transferring back and forth. But when I travel and when I'm you know sitting in bed doing things, I would really much like really like to have a larger screen. So I think an iPad is in order. And when I travel, rather than carrying the Windows laptop with me, which I must say is an older one, big and heavy, I would much prefer to be able to try to do everything I can on an iPad. But it's going to require me to use a keyboard. It could be Bluetooth. It doesn't need to be the fancy schmancy one. And the only thing that I found is that certain uh, websites, I guess, don't really work well in iOS. They're not really designed for it. You can't do certain things. But I can work around that with most situations. So I'm wondering, based on all the new models coming out, what iPad I should be looking at. I don't do a lot of things um, in terms of storage. I store everything either on the phone. I got a little bit of Dropbox. I don't pay for online storage. I use Google Photos. So anything that I save, I would probably keep on the iPad or then transfer over to the uh, to my desktop at some point or another, one way or another, through Dropbox or something to be able to continue to work on. So what do you need to work on? If you, if you Let's imagine that, that, uh, that travel that you're taking and you leave the laptop back and you bring an iPad with you. What, uh, what stuff do you need to do when you're out? What's the stuff you absolutely do need to still be able to do even without your laptop? Um, mostly Windows documents. I need to be able to communicate via Skype. I need to be able to communicate uh, online. And if I could, I would like to be able to continue to uh, record my, some of my podcasts and such on there with uh, the external microphone that I have that I can connect through lightning port. So that's not an issue. Right. Yes, I've I've tried to record a lot of podcasts on iPad, and it's getting better. But uh, but yeah, it's 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 some effort. I feel like you don't necessarily need an iPad Pro, although they're very nice and they have uh, better multitasking support than I, I think the the iPad, the fifth generation iPad that has no name, that was the successor to the iPad Air, um, would it's a lot cheaper and it would work for you depending on how heavily you're you're uh, you're using it when you're traveling. The iPad Pro editing? might be nicer. What about audio editing? I, right now I use Audacity with, uh, within my Windows unit, and I do need to edit like that. Oh, yeah. 
I, what would how what would I edit with on that, and and what kind of processor would I need for that? Well, I think again, the funny thing is, I think you could probably do it on the on the iPad. Although the iPad Pro will be a little nicer, and um, there is a great app for that that I'll mention in a moment. I, I will say you mentioned it can be Bluetooth. This is something that I think a lot of people um, misunderstand about the iPad Pro that just because it has the smart connector and it's nice because you don't have to pair it and it doesn't provide any. Uh, you don't have to have a battery that you have to charge. But you know, Bluetooth keyboards are great. I am sitting here with my iPad right now in the studio using a Bluetooth keyboard on an iPad Pro, and it's great. So I think you can definitely do that. And the iPad Pro is going to be more powerful than that iPad. And, uh, and and that might help you with audio editing, although you may be able to do it even without. And the app you want to look for is one called Ferrite, F-E-R-R-I-T-E, Ferrite Recording Studio. And I use that to edit podcasts on my iPad. And it's really good. It is, I think it's free to try. And then the advanced editing features, I, I think all in, it's 20 bucks. And I, I would put it up against something like Logic or Audition, these multi-hundred dollar professional audio editors for the desktop. Top. It's a. Uh, it's it's really good. It's better than Audacity. Um, I, I really like it a lot. So you can definitely edit your podcast right on uh, the iPad with with Ferrite. So I think you know. I think it ends up coming down to your budget. That if you don't want to spend too much, that uh, lower cost iPad will work for you. But if you're gonna if you're gonna stress it out. Hmm? Because which uh, because it, it says iPad, but there's you know the UC iPad Air. I don't. I just don't understand the Apple right. model. So, so which one are we talking about? iPad Pro, I know is one or right. So so this one? is the Apple naming problem. So Apple used to have the iPad Air, and then they had the iPad Air two, and those are basically discontinued now. And they have what they're calling the iPad, which is the fifth generation iPad. So they're selling that. I think that's three fifty. And then the iPad Pros are obviously more expensive than that. The iPad uh, iPad with no other name is, you know, it's cheaper, it's older technology. It's sort of three-year-old kind of technology inside it. It's basically an iPad Air. Um, but it is still, you know, pretty powerful and pretty capable. So it depends on how heavily, you know, you're planning on using it and and all that. But it'll do it'll do a lot of that work. You mentioned um, Office documents and Windows documents. That's that's an actually an area that I'm, I'm really happy about how powerful the iPad is. That um, I think Microsoft Office on iPad is better than it is on the Mac. I'm sure it's better on Windows, but uh, the, Microsoft did an amazing job with Office. So if you have Office documents, it works great. And then there are any number of other apps that will open sort of standard Office uh, type file formats on the iPad. So I don't I don't think it'll be that much of an issue. It's got uh, good Dropbox integration. It's got good OneDrive integration. So on that on that front, I think you'll be safe. Is there anything else you're worried about not working on the iPad? I think pretty much I can get most anything else to work at this point. What kind of storage capacity should I? Or what are the maximum capacities on on both the Pro and the regular iPad? Well, that that is a good question. I think the the Pro goes up to 512 gigs at this point, which is just kind of ridiculous. Um, I'm I'm looking up what's what's on the iPad. Um, it, it's, it really depends. If you're not going to load it up with a lot of files, especially if you've got a little bit of cloud storage, I mean, we're, we're talking the regular iPad is 32 or 128. So 32 is a little bit tight, but you could probably do it if you're really on a budget. Um, 128. With the 128, because one of my recording apps that works with my Shure Motive right. mics records in waveform only. So Yeah, you're, if you're doing podcasting, you're right. 128 is probably a better idea. And that, that's a, that, that would be... Um, you know, that's a let's see that what does that cost? It's it's not a lot. It's four twenty nine for the one twenty eight. So as iPads go historically, that's pretty cheap. Um, again, you're not going to get all of the fancy features of the iPad Pro, but I'm not sure you need them. Um, again, if you, especially since this is sort of your first experience with the iPad, if you end up really loving it and finding out that you want to push it even further, the fact is there's a pretty good real resale market for those. You could always sell that and upgrade to an iPad Pro down the road. But I think you'll find it surprisingly capable, even down at 429 for the 128 gig model. So the 128 is the max, and uh, and then if I were to go with the Pro, maybe go with the 256. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, and that's just sort of up up to you. And then in terms of size, you know, the the 10.5 is going to feel just like a traditional iPad. And then if you want a big 13 inch display, it's a pound and a half instead of a pound, but uh, it's still uh, it's still pretty good. So anyway, that's uh, we're going to take a break. But Mike, thank you so much for your call. I hope I helped and spent a little bit of your money. We'll be back on the Tech Guy Live. You're out. Yeah, people don't know about Microsoft Office on iPad. It's really good. Like, I, I think I, I, I'm not kidding. Um, I think I would prefer to use it on an iPad than on a Mac at this point. 
Hey, here's Leo with something important for you. Hey, thanks to Jason Snell for filling in for me. Our show today brought to you by a, a, a great sponsor, a company I really like a lot, Quicken Loans. I can tell you what, we made the mistake of going to a bank last time we got a home loan three years ago. It took more, it took like, like months, and they kept going wanting more information. Next time it's Rocket Mortgage. The, the loan experience is really, you know, most you go to most lenders, you're back in the eight, the 19th century. You know, it's really, they practically have a calculator on the day. Actually, they still, many still do. Let me tell you, that uh, loan, I could just give you that loan rate right here. That's crazy. We live in the age of communications, of computers, of, of the internet. That's why I love Quicken Loans and I love Rocket Mortgage. They created a, a, a modern technological focused client focused mortgage solution rocket mortgage lets you do everything online and i mean everything including your phone your tablet your computer all the records you need to supply your financial information you just it's all done online with touch of a button because rocket mortgage has relationships with all the banks and everything that makes it very easy you get to pick the loan that's right for you they go through all your details they 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 they, they will find the right loan and they do this all not in months weeks not days minutes minutes you could do it in open house you could apply for a home loan and before you leave you know hey we like this let's let's buy it and before you leave show the realtor look we're approved thanks to rocket mortgage rocket mortgage find the loan that's right for you from a lender that's great the best apply simply understand fully and mortgage confidently at rocket mortgage by quick and loans go to rocketmortgage.com slash tech guy to get started rocketmortgage.com slash tech guy by the way they do refis too and with interest rates going up and we know they're going to go up uh now's the time if you're going to refi to lock in a rate rocketmortgage.com slash tech guy equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states nmls consumer access.org number 30 30 i love rocket mortgage and i thank them for their support of the tech guy show rocketmortgage.com slash tech guy Back to you, Jason. Yeah, thanks, Leo. All right, so exciting times for me as I uh, ride this beast, this this wild bronco that is the Tech Guy Radio. Um, in the chat room, we got a nice comment from somebody who said we didn't talk about the cellular options on the iPad, and and that's true, I didn't. It's about one hundred and thirty bucks extra to get cellular. It's real convenient, but I, I got the sense from Mike in Maine that he was a little bit hesitant. He was trying this out, dipping his toe in the water, and I'm not sure what his budget was. And he has, he has a smartphone, so he could tether. And it's not as easy as cellular, but it's free, basically. So, But we could have gone into it. I, I ran out of time is the bottom line. 8888-ASK-LEO. Call that number, and you won't get to ask Leo, but you will get to ask me. Jason Snell spent a long time at Macworld, podcaster, writer, guy who is sitting here pushing buttons because Leo isn't. And I think we got a call that could be very interesting from, hey, it's where I went to college. It's Max in San Diego. Hi, Max. Hello, what's Jason. Your, I have a question. What's your question? Lay it on me. How, how are things okay. in San Diego right now? Are they, uh, are, are, is it too hot down there? Or are you doing okay? Um, you know, it, it's always spectacular here, whether it rain or shine. <laughs> That's right. You are right. You are right, sir. What's your question? Okay, here it goes. Um, MQA, Master Quality Authenticated for audio people, who I thought uh, uh, the prior host was going to be on today. He's a home theater guy. Oh, yeah, so I you know. You are pretty much tied to the uh, Mac world, and there's this thing called the, um, the iTunes store um, <laughs> on Tidal right now. They have master quality authenticated, which you can use for streaming or purchasing. I was wondering if Apple had any plans for that and whether or not you could explain to the audience what it means for the future of people who love to listen to music, either at home or on the go. Well, so now, correct me if I'm wrong, MQA is higher resolution audio, although it's still lossy compression. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah. Now. Yeah. So basically, audio in order to fit audio on CDs in order to fit audio on um, on uh, iPods 
and other other things like that. We have needed to uh, do this thing where we uh, compress it, and, and the way that works is that uh, you save file storage uh, space by completely uh, throwing away stuff that the the algorithm thinks that you can't hear, and that's the that's the idea there. And so MQA is the latest uh, in compression technology, and it's trying to do a a better job of getting it down to a very a smaller size but very high quality this is the balance between uncompressed audio and uh, high resolution audio and something that is a um that that is a, a balance there that that sounds way better than let's say an mp3 or aac file which are compressed but are not uh the huge file sizes that uncompressed audio will will send so that's that's the challenge with all of this and Apple has not talked about this, but you know it's it's funny because the um, th the fact is that Apple's brand is very much about high quality stuff, and I do wonder like Apple Music has 128k AAC streams. That's what it's got, and that is not terrible, but it's not great. So. Um, and Tidal has tried to make a name and not really done a fantastic job of it, to be honest. They're struggling as a business in being a high-quality stream provider. I do wonder if at some point one of the major players will find a way to extract more money from their customers by saying, we have high-quality streams available if you throw in. Like, Netflix is an example I can give. I uh, am a Netflix uh, subscriber, and I pay for the 4K stream because I have a 4K TV. Now... Can I tell the difference on my relatively, I mean, it's not small by modern standards, but it's not huge television set. Can I really see the extra pixels of a 4K resolution episode of Daredevil over the 1080 version that I would get for a few dollars less per month? I'm skeptical about that. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's better quality, maybe it isn't, um, but I am paying for it because I do have that TV and I kind of want to have the higher quality. And so I do wonder if Spotify or Apple, and Apple would seem to be a great example of that, would make those available either as purchases or as an upgrade to, um, to Apple Music. But who knows if that will actually happen. They've said nothing about it. So Max, if you're still there, are you, would, you, would you pay extra for a feature like that or are you paying extra for something like that now? Well, I don't have the uh, the capability right now as far as decoding because it's an, it's basically a new uh, decoding process. Um, you need some hardware to back it up. Some say, no, you don't need it. Um, I'm a little bit confused on that. That's why I called the show to sort of get a heads up on yeah. what uh, the future of Apple products might be. Because to put another chip into a, one of these phones or iPads or even in their desktops doesn't seem to be that much of a stretch. But it has to be something that they would have to embrace, and that was something I was hoping that you could tell me about. But uh, they usually stay closed-lipped about these things until they, they actually launch anything. So I guess they're playing wait and see. But a lot of the um, uh, studios are sort of lining up. Some of the bigger, higher-quality um, catalogs are, that are out there are sort of getting in line to sort of have their uh, catalogs um, uh, remastered in this way so that um, streaming for one, which is a gener uh, revenue generator for them, as well as uh, purchasing, seems to just be the new latest and greatest thing that will be coming down the road. I mean, it's here already, but it's just not uh, universally embraced. And when Apple, I think, steps forward and makes that um, embracement, it's going to be huge because, uh, from my understanding, the Apple uh, store is the largest music store in the world online, and it's just yeah, I'm yeah. just looking for that level of quality to just shine that most people have been sort of not getting from MP3 or ACC. Or AAC, uh, right, right. Well, um, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see. And uh, thanks, Max, for the call. Um, it'll be interesting to see because the way Apple often does things is by not um, following a standard. So it's entirely possible that what will happen is that Apple will use... I'll give you an example. Apple just announced that their new operating systems that are coming out this fall will support entirely new formats for audio and video. They're going to record in these high-efficiency coding standards. And that it's for video, and it's also for pictures. They won't be recording JPEGs, and they won't be recording uh, H.264 or MP4 files. It's going to be this new standard. And that, that means they have custom hardware. I think that's also in the I iPhone 7 even now that will support that format. So 
that makes me wonder like would that what what's happening with audio there and do they care about the audio is there high efficiency audio encoding going on or is it all about video and would apple if apple thinks there's a market for that high quality audio they will bring it in uh, to their their chips that they make and they will build it into their hardware and then it'll be uh, decodable by their services and they'll offer it that's sort of the the apple secret sauce here is they build a lot of the processors, they build their own hardware, they write their own software, they've got their own music and video services, and they kind of put that all together, and that's your Apple secret sauce. Um, the challenge is that when you talk about something like Master Quality Authenticated, which is this outside standard, does Apple embrace that, uh, or does Apple build its own thing? Or, and this is entirely possible, does Apple look at the market for higher quality audio and say, you know, most people can't tell, and the market for people who can is so small that we, you know, we aren't going to go there, and we we aren't going to serve it. And so far, that has been the answer for almost everything, is that the market for higher quality audio isn't there. Um, we, we mentioned a la carte purchases. That That's a part of this, too, that a la carte music purchases are going down, 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 and streaming services are rising up. But a higher bandwidth inducing format, a format where the files are just physically so much bigger, is a harder sell for streaming. So you know, building something that's going to be more successful with an a la carte service where you're buying your music. A lot of us are comfortable buying music and not comfortable streaming it. But this sounds like a, a format that's made for buying. If if you're Apple and you look at that market and you say it's going down and streaming is coming up, you know, what are they going to invest their time and, and, and research into? Making Apple Music better, their streaming service, or making uh, the iTunes store have some more stuff in it when they see sales falling off there. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not um, I'm not optimistic about that. But I do know there are people who really believe in high quality audio and multi channel audio and all sorts of different forms of audio that sounds better than what we have today on these streaming services. And um, I think that market will be served. Um, but the question is, how big is that market? And nobody's taken the plunge yet. Maybe Apple will do it. It's not outside the realm of possibility for their brand. You're listening to the Tech Guy eight 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 Ask Leo. We'll be back with more questions and answers in a minute. Tech Guy Live. I'm Jason Snell, sitting in for Leo Laporte, who was on assignment, and that assignment was to get a vacation, you, you knucklehead. Take some time off. I, uh, I'm going to be answering a lot of your questions. we got a lot of interesting stuff going on. 8888 Ask Leo to ask me, who is not Leo, and uh, I'll see what I can do to help. Not being Leo, but I will try to help. Let's go talk to George in Chino, California. Hello. George, hello. How you doing, Jason? I'm doing great. Um, You're doing a great job, man. Th You're doing a great thank job. you. I'm hanging in there. I am I am not Leo, but I am trying to push all the buttons Leo pushes. <laughs> How can I help you? I just have a few functionality basic questions. On, I just have a laptop, Windows 10. For, like, when, when the first question is, is like, they, you know, they, they may sound simple, but uh, the Java updates, I get that usually from the bottom taskbar. Are those usually safe to... Um, to, to tap on, and is it, is it necessary, Java updates? Should I keep that up? Or? Well, so I am not the world's best uh, Windows expert at all. I do have Windows 10 installed on my computer, too. Um, I dual boot it with the Mac. Um, uh -huh. And I get those Java updates, too. I, I, I guess what I would say is, um, are you if, if things you do require them, like say you need to do a Java update, then you need to do them. Otherwise, you could probably ignore them, and it's fine. Now, they may say, like, this is an important security update, um, and if that's the case, it's probably better safe than sorry. But um, right. sometimes, like, I know I have a couple apps that require Java, and those are the ones where I will say, all right, I need to do this. Um, and But they often will tell me. But, you know, if that... that from, go ahead. If they're from the bottom task bar, that means they're coming from your computer, so they're safe, it's safe, right? Yeah, it should be okay. Although, again, I'm not I'm not an expert here, but the Java stuff, uh, the J Java stuff is, is probably okay. Then again... Um, you know, and and best chance is that it's trying to fix a security problem, <laughs> and so staying okay. up to date these days, staying up to date is generally safer than not because okay. they're often patching security problems. That said, you know there is the question like, are you are you using Java somewhere on your system or not? Uh, but okay. but it would uh, you know the, the other thing to do if you want to be safe, and I'm getting some help from our uh, our chat room here too, is you could always go to directly to Oracle and download the latest okay. Java from there, and then you'll know that it's safe because it's coming straight from Oracle instead of from your taskbar. Okay. And then my main question, really quick, I have because uh, I, I had uh, when I just got the computer, it's a pretty new computer, a couple years old. I have like four or five anti-spyware on there, one of them being Avast, 
uh, you know, super anti spyware uh, spy bot. Should I should I get rid of most, all of them, or because a vast seems to be kind of an intrusive. And it just comes down. It seems like pretty decent, you know. It's it, you know, it's basically it's complimentary. So should I at least keep one, or should I get rid of all of them? Because uh, sometimes Leo says that you don't even need them. Yeah, I, I'm of two minds about that. Like spyware, it, it is it is potentially scary. Then again, I I like the idea that you have multiple spyware things. Like finding it out, are they spying on each other? <laughs> and I I don't know what's going on there. Keeping one right. would not be would not be the worst thing in the world. But unless you're downloading like software from weird places on the internet, you may not need to worry about it at all. Um, and if you do uninstall them and then get worried. You could always go back and reinstall one, but uh, you know, I I'm I got to be honest. I'm I know I'm a Mac person and not a Windows person, but Windows 10 is a pretty safe operating system too. And I I don't run antivirus or anti spyware stuff, and I haven't. So I think you're probably safe. Certainly, I don't think you need four of them. You don't you don't think you think it's slowing it, uh, the computer down a little bit? But it's potentially they could potentially even be um, they could be doing nothing or they could be conflicting with with each other. And if one's getting in your way and really bugging you, I think that I think that you know don't have more than one. That's that's my yeah one or zero are the are the optimal numbers for that. So I hope that's help. I hope that's helpful. Yes, sir. Yes, All right, sir. thank one, you. One, just one, 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 one yeah, more. Yeah, sure. Because sometimes I get an update. It says iTunes for for Mac for Mac. And it's I always ask it always comes up. It's a window uh, for to update. And I don't. I mean, I don't have a Mac. I mean, does that have? You think it has any bearing on my computer at all, or should I just? No, probably not. Do you have like an iPhone or an iPad, iPod or something? No, no. No, I would. I would get rid of that then. And you may have done an iTunes install at some point, or a QuickTime installer, or something like that. And you could take that out if you don't have Apple devices. Um, I would get rid of that on your Windows okay. PC for sure. Well, Thank thanks, you, Jason. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Jason Snell sitting in for Leo Laporte, 8888 Ask Leo for the Tech Guy Live. Let's go to another call. Let's go to Steve in L.A. Hi, Steve. Hey, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Thanks for calling. Good. I was in L.A. when I called. I'm in Oregon now. You're, <laughs> you're, you're mobile. Yeah, I know. You've been, you've been hanging out. Thanks for hanging on. Yeah, no problem. Enjoying your show. Um, my question was, uh, I've had uh, my iMac uh, for, bought it in 2009 and been waiting, 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 waiting uh, for them to finally come out with one. They finally have, and uh, I, I'm going to get a 27-inch, um, and I was. it says on the Apple specs that the mid-range iMac 27-inch is only, um, you can only put, add up to 32 meg of RAM. Well, I've been reading that you can uh, buy aftermarket up to 64, and it's been tested, and it works. Have you heard anything on that? Well, the the um, I'm on the Apple spec page right now, and the current 27-inch right. iMac, the one they're selling right now, the 5K iMac, is that the one you're looking at? Yeah, the mid-range one. The mid-range one, so that's 1999. Um, the mid the mid-range 27-inch iMac is configurable up to 64. So you okay, do what the, then the low range twenty seven inch the uh, well so the seventeen ninety nine one they will let you configure to sixteen or thirty two I think it is user configurable to sixty four although I'm not one hundred percent on that the nice thing about the twenty seven inch is the twenty seven inch iMac has a door the only thing you can upgrade in the entire iMac is the RAM the RAM slots are available. You unscrew the little door, and you can put slots in there. And it says configurable to 16 or 32. My gut feeling is that that's an Apple thing where they they want you to spend $200 more to get the to get the the greater RAM. Plus, the cost of the RAM, the aftermarket RAM, is, is considerably cheaper than the Apple RAM. It, yeah, that's always the case. I when I bought my 5K iMac a couple of years ago, I made sure. I bought it with the least amount of RAM available, and right. then I went to okay. an online reseller of RAM and bought new RAM yeah. and opened up that little door and put them in, and it's a much better deal. So the only question yeah. would be like if there's some other feature, like the mid-range one's a little bit faster. It's got a faster turbo right. boost and all that on the on the i5 processor, and they'll let you configure it. But even if you got that mid-range one, I wouldn't I wouldn't configure it with extra RAM. I'd buy it. I mean, do the math, right? Look at look at the difference sure. in in, in uh, throwing away the 16 that they give you and putting in. Uh, 232 gig uh, dims, but right. but you know what? I, I'll bet you it'll be cheaper to do that and just have third-party RAM in there. Or just buy the 8 
and and then uh, buy. You can buy a sixty four package. I think it's is it OWC. Oh, yeah. You're, yeah, uh, or OWC is one place. Crucial is oh, another place. There are a bunch yeah. of places that offer them. And yeah, you're right. The base is eight, and then you can go up to sixteen thirty two. So yeah, buy it with eight. Take those two four gigabyte uh, slots, and basically, you know, order your RAM, and and that's exactly what I did. You just pop them out. You never use them. It's wasteful. I hate it, but it's way cheaper to buy that third party RAM and put it in there. And I've been really happy. I, I you know, I I know so many people who do this, and they're all happy with it. It's not you're not making a risk risky decision by doing the third party RAM in your iMac. Okay, that's great advice. Can I ask you one question about the iPhone and location? Really, really quick. Um, Waze only lets you use it if you say you can see my location always. Uh, many other apps say, you know, when in use. Let's, let's, uh, see, let's talk about that uh, in just a moment. We're going to go to a break right now. We'll be back shortly. This is Tech Guy Live. You're out. Sorry about that, Steve. Steve, you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so we we left the radio, but um, why don't you give me your question? We're on the uh, we're on the Twit network now. Sure. Well, ways you know the the locations uh, you can uh, many of the apps. I've got an iPhone seven. Many of the apps say you know you, uh, you can use it'll use your location when it's running or never, and some say always or never. Right. So, like for example, Waze is always. Right. So what? So how does that affect? What does that? What does that really tell me? Uh, it's a slightly different policy. They're actually changing this behavior in the next OS update in iOS 11, where uh, you'll be able to say um, only when the app is running for any app. Because right now the app gets to to ask for always or when the app is running, and that's why it, right. you get the different language yeah. there. Um, and you know that's that's so that they can they can check in the background and what? give you alerts. It's <laughs> it's mostly for GPSs and stuff, but. Right. It, it's gotten abused, so actually know, the next update is changing right it. Where, they always know right where you are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're supposed to, I think after some point they, they relinquish that, and uh, but you're you're kind of putting your faith in the app to do it. So they're, they're, that's why they're changing the security policy. Okay. Hey, thanks so much. You, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for hanging on so long. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. I sense a great disturbance in the forest. Perhaps it's a message from Leo of Import. We'll have more with uh, the tech guy. I thank Jason Snell for filling in for me. I'll be back from vacation tomorrow. Tomorrow. Um, meanwhile, I want to tell you about one of our sponsors, one of our newest sponsors on the Tech Guy Show. And this I really like. It's called Wistia. It's a video hosting platform for business. More than 300,000 businesses now use Wistia because it is, first of all, it's branded with your company's name. So, I mean, that means it looks, you know, this looks super pro. And you get all the analytics you could ever want, including things like heat maps, which shows what people are looking at, trend graphs, engagement graphs, showing how they're responding to your video, how long they're watching your video, and a whole lot more. Uh, you can capture email addresses within the video. So it's great for marketing. That's why uh, HubSpot uses Wistia as their video hosting platform. That's why Cirque du Soleil uses it. That's why Starbucks uses it. I know, maybe you've never heard of Wistia, but now you have. Check it out. W-I-S-T-I-A dot com. You can use video throughout your business, and you can integrate it with existing marketing automation software. Maybe you use Marketo. It works with them and many others. So you can get that information and then and then import it right from the video player as part of an overall strategy. Look, you, you if you're not using branded video, if you're just, you know, putting it on somebody else's platform, that's that's just amateurs. You got to do it right. And there's no reason not to. Your first three videos are free. Upload them now to wistia.com, W I S T I A.com. Your free account gives you three video uploads, advanced video analytics, all the features integrations built with business in mind. It's business video. It's not a toy. This is the real deal. W I S T I A.com. Will you check it out for me? It's free. Get started today. W I S T I A, wistia. Dot com, and we thank him so much for supporting the Tech Guy podcast. Now back to Jason Snell. You're live. Welcome back to the Tech Guy Live. My name is Jason Snell. I'm sitting in for Leo Laporte today. Leo is, I have just been informed by reliable sources, he has landed back home after a very long vacation making his way home. And you know what that means. He's going to be unpacking luggage. He's going to be doing laundry. He's going to be jet lagged. And he'll be back next week. 
for the Tech Guy Live, but instead you get me. I am Jason Snell. I uh, am a podcaster at Relay FM and TheIncomparable.com. I was the editor at Macworld for many years. Still write a column there every week, and I write about Apple stuff and some other tech stuff at SixColors.com. And I'm looking to answer your questions today, especially if you've got Apple-related questions. Those are my favorite, but I will try my best to answer your questions. 8888 ask leo you won't ask leo you'll ask me but that's the number to call and uh we've got some room now on the on the board so call now if you've always wanted to ask a question about apple stuff now is a great time to do it i mentioned earlier on in the show about the e3 expo going on in uh, in la that just finished that's the gaming convention uh for the gaming industry and one of the things that um, I mentioned in passing was the announcement of a new Xbox console called the Xbox... Let me see if I can get this right. The Xbox One X, which I believe if you um, turn that into an acronym, you get X-B-O-X, which is Xbox. So the Xbox One X. So there's a, now Microsoft's made an Xbox. They made an Xbox One. And now they've made another Xbox. That's The Xbox One wasn't the first one. It was the third one. It's very confusing. But the interesting trend in console makers, because there's, of course, a PlayStation 4 Pro as well. Um, these, these two giants who are grappling to be the supreme gaming console. It has a lot to do with... Uh, uh, generations of console, you know, you go from PlayStation 3 to PlayStation 4 and your games don't work necessarily. That happened to me when I went from Xbox 360 to the Xbox One. Some games were brought over in a compatibility mode and others weren't. And that was very sad. Um, we seem to be getting a point now where these generations are lasting much longer and they're making hub har hardware upgrades in the meantime. It's a little bit like using a PC where you know you can run Windows 10 and many games on that PC you bought, but you may not be able to run them as well or with as high quality graphics. And although that's troubling if you're somebody who always sort of expected that you'd buy a console and it would be able to do everything possible, it is kind of cool in the sense that the people who really care about the cutting edge hardware can spend that extra money for the high end brand new console like the PlayStation 4 Pro or the Xbox One X. And other people who are more cost conscious and don't really care about that super high resolution mode or the VR add-on can uh, pay less money for a little bit less powerful device. And I think that's uh, actually pretty cool, if you ask me. So it's an interesting trend in the gaming industry that uh, we, we just, we, we're, we're seeing it continue. Meanwhile, Nintendo, they got the Switch. It's totally different. It's weird. That's Nintendo. T -t Nintendo and Apple, it strikes me, have a lot in common. Uh, they do things their own way. Let, it, let us take a call, I think, Dan from Fresno has been waiting very patiently. Hi, Dan. Hi, Jason. How's it going? Um, it's doing great. I am hanging in there, uh, running. It's hard to fill Leo's shoes. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. What's your question? Um, I've been having an issue where somebody keeps trying to log in using my Apple ID. Oh, so man. I get the message on my iPhone that somebody's trying to connect. You know, do I want to allow it or not? I have two factors set up. I'm not real worried about them knowing my my you know email and password, but when I'm when they do this and I'm watching something on say my Apple TV, it knocks me off the stream and I have to go back in and restart it, and it happens a lot. All right, especially on the weekends. And so I was wondering, is there a way to disconnect? I'm assuming they just they just know my email address. Is there a way to like disconnect the email address that I have now? And, and use a different one. But, I, you know, from what I've been reading, when I do that, that sometimes you can lose, like, in-app purchases and and things like that. And I don't know if you know anything about that. Right. So the... Um the thing you want to do, so Apple's got some stuff about it, and this is a tough one. I have some, not my Apple ID, but I have some services where I, where I got Jason as my username, and I thought, I am so awesome. And then I realized everybody named Jason in the world was going to hit the password reset button on that, and I get those things all the time, and it's so annoying. Um, and the and I, I have friends who this happens to them, and I can't decide whether it's they've got common email addresses or whether they're being pranked by somebody, but either way, it is really awful. So... 
there, there are a few different ways to do it. One thing I want to recommend is there's a, a, a website you can go to that's appleid.apple.com. That allow, you can actually log in and do... There's a lot of stuff there. You can see all the devices that are logged in with your Apple ID. Um, it's pretty powerful. So you can go to Apple ID. So, so what Apple recommends is that you sign out of all your devices, and then you go to appleid.apple.com, and you can click an edit button and actually click change Apple ID and um, and then change your Apple ID. So Apple will let you change your Apple ID. They'll also let you change the email address associated with the Apple ID. But it sounds like the way, the place you have to do it is at appleid.apple.com, which is a website a lot of people just don't even know about. But it's kind of amazing when you go there. It knows every device you've ever logged into with your Apple ID and a whole bunch of other stuff too. It's actually really useful. So that may solve your problem, I hope. Okay. Yeah, I don't think it's somebody that has the same email address, the same name, because I use my first name, a middle initial, and my last name. Yeah, so it's... You know, and, and so it's it seems more like somebody trying to... And they're pretty persistent. They try once, and then a couple of minutes later, and then they'll wait about 15, 20 minutes, and they'll try two more times, and it keeps happening. You'd be surprised so, how many people don't know what their email address is, <laughs> and I know that sounds ridiculous, <laughs> but and, and the, the, the world is big enough that they, there may be somebody yeah. out there who has your same initials, because I, I have had, I have a friend who gets emails all the time for somebody who is a professional person, and they give out their email address to clients, and it's not their email address, and I've had that with, uh, right. there's a Jay Snell um, that uh, that is a, I think a, like a Jennifer Snell, who's like a wedding photographer, and I, I would get emails emails all the time from wedding couples saying, are we on for, for our reservation for our wedding? And I, I actually had to write them back and, and say, I'm so sorry. They did not give you the right email address. So you'd be surprised that, um, that it may just be somebody who's clueless and doesn't understand why it doesn't yeah. work and then remembers yeah. and then forgets again. But go to appleid.apple.com and see, because that's going to be your best chance. And if that doesn't work, if you get frustrated, call Apple support because I bet they will help you. But if you can do it yourself on the website, I think that's going to be the easiest way to do it. Okay. I'll do that then. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That was great. I Maybe I helped somebody there. It's always nice when we help somebody. I think we have maybe another call. Let's go to Michael in Georgia. Michael, hello. You're on. Hey, Jason. How's it going? It's going great. What's your question? Good, good. good. I got a question for you. Uh, rumor has it, you know, the iPhone is going to be called the iPhone 8, the 10th anniversary edition this year. Right. Uh, if it's called the iPhone 8 this year, what's next year is going to be called? Well, well, that's a good question. Probably, if if it's anything that they've been doing lately, it might be like the 8s, right, next year. But who knows? Because they've also got like the seven. Are they going to do a 7s and an eight the same year? Nobody really knows. That's the mystery of of Apple Apple product naming. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I just didn't. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I, if you do an 8s next year, then you will have an S every year instead of a, you know just a number. So yeah, I, I, at some point. Um, at some point, you got to wonder when Apple gives up on the whole number thing just because are we going to buy iPhone 17s? At some point, they're going to have to break it. They've done that actually with the iPad where they went with numbering for the iPad for a while and they seem to have backed off of that. Like there's no, you don't buy a MacBook 14 or an iMac 11 from Apple, right? You just buy the latest iMac. And I, I do wonder if Apple will have to break that at some point. Maybe it'll be with this fancy new iPhone. Maybe it won't be an iPhone 8. Uh, we'll see this fall because it'll definitely happen. 8888 Ask Leo. It's the tech guy. You're out. Hey, Michael, you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, we're off the radio, but if you if you got another question, I'm happy to answer it. No, I just I called up. I mean, you just hard to get in. Luckily, I'll be yeah. pretty quickly with you. So, it's like the first time I've ever got in, but I've been a listener for you for a long time. I mean, you come on Twitter all the time, so. Awesome. Well, thank you for calling. I really appreciate it. Hey, no problem, man. You have a blessed day. All right. You too. Ah, uh, that's nice. So yeah, appleid.apple.com, if you don't know, it is actually, I did a couple stories on Macworld about this, but it's really interesting. Um, the uh, the uh, device list, and if you want to like force a device off of your Apple ID, basically like 
say like this is I don't even have this anymore why why is this not still in there you can go in there and like take take this off my Apple ID but it'll it'll show you all the ones that Apple Pay is on on it'll show you it's like every model it'll show you the serial numbers of the of the devices if it knows them like I, I can tap here and I've got the serial number of my Mac mini that's logged in um, and and it's pretty it's pretty sweet it's a pretty good website so you should know it and yes you can change your data there that's the uh, it's funny that Apple with all their app development and all that is uh, in the end just go to this website it's just easier that way go to the website it works I've scroll I'm way behind on the chat room I've completely Lee. Yeah, Knox Harrington. Uh, the carriers probably insist on the version numbers. It's it, it may be true, although I don't know. Apple has so much leverage. I don't think Apple cares. I, I they could insist. I don't think Apple would do anything. I, I think everybody's going to be excited about the new iPhone regardless. And they'll find ways to promote it. Um, but the disadvantage is you can't say it looks just like the old one, but it's slightly better. It's this year's, it's the S model, right? If it doesn't have a name, you can't say this is the new iPhone S. And then the next year say, well, this is the new iPhone. And then the next year say, this year, year say, this is the new iPhone S. So the qu real question is, do they, you know, and they still, they sell older models of iPhone, which is another challenge. As long as you've got a six and a six S and a seven in the lineup, you can't call them all the iPhone. Like with the MacBook, when a new MacBook comes out or a new iMac or really a new iPad at this point, the old one goes away and they don't do that with the iPhone. So we're probably stuck with the numbers for a while. Um, but with the when they update the iPhone SE, I don't think it's going to get a number, right? That'll still be the iPhone SE, and it may be that there at some point is just sort of like an iPhone Plus and an iPhone and an iPhone SE, but we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Someday. What do we have? Who's our next caller? Oh, next caller is going to be oh, it's IMAX and keyboards. Oh, I love those things. All right, well. Get ready for some keyboard nerdery, I think, in the next segment. That is exciting. Yes, I, I keep, I, what I want to do is put my, um, my hand up to my ear and say, we're hearing now that Leo is approaching the Golden Gate Bridge. But what's not going to happen is Leo's motorcade is not going to roll into Petaluma and stop by Twit. That's not going to happen. It's the Tech Guy Live. I'm Jason Snell sitting in for Leo Laporte, slowly making his way back from his wonderful, wonderful vacation. So you got me. Leo will be back next week. But I'm answering calls. 8888-ASK-LEO. I'm Jason Snell, the uh, former editor at Macworld for many a year. Now I write at sixcolors.com. Let's take a phone call. Let us go to Gina in Venice, California. Gina, hello. Hi, thank, thank you. Thank you for taking on uh, Leo's uh, shoes there. You're doing a good job. Thank you very much. It is, uh, that, that, that guy is a giant in broadcasting and tech broadcasting. I mean, I've known him a long time, but to sit in his chair, it's quite a thing. It's quite a privilege. You had a, uh, you had a, an iMac keyboard related question. Is that right? I, I do. Um, I, for work, I'm on the computer all the time, and I just find the uh, I have the the um, keyboard with the numbers um, because I needed numbers, but the the keys are so close together um, and flat. Um, I really would like something that gives me a little more comfort, um, but I know Mac. Does, uh, Apple does not create anything other than the type of uh, keyboard I've, I've, uh, I'm using. Is there anything out there? Um, don't tell Apple. That is non-Apple that I could use in its place and that it would function um, on an Apple iMac. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There are many really good keyboards out there. In fact, okay. the, the problem is that a lot of them you can't uh, you can't try. You kind of have to uh, you have to go on on your gut and order one on Amazon and try it and bring it in. But you, you definitely can't. I'll definitely recommend that you go to thewirecutter.com. They've got some best keyboard 
articles. They've got one about Bluetooth keyboards. They've got one about mechanical keyboards, which are the ones with a lot more key travel where the keys move up and down and, it, and they, get, they get a little clicky. I have one of those. I have a, a, it's a Windows mechanical keyboard. It's actually called a 60% keyboard. It doesn't have the number pad on it, but it is, um, and I love it. So, so essentially your, your Mac can use any keyboard that's out there. And in the uh, system preferences, there is a, a keyboard, uh, the, in, under keyboards, I believe it is, there's actually even an option to swap the command and option keys, which is the key thing for a Windows keyboard is those two keys need to be reversed on a Mac. There are also lots of utilities like Keyboard Maestro that will let you customize a Windows keyboard. I'd say there are also a lot of really great Mac keyboards out there. Um, okay. uh, Logitech makes some, Kensington makes some, Matthias makes some great um some great mechanical keyboards. And I think that's the wire cutter recommendation for a Mac mechanical keyboard is Matthias. They're at M A T I A S dot C A. Um, but the good news is you can get a better keyboard that will work with your Mac the way you want it. I guarantee it. There's just so many to choose from. It depends on, do you want wireless or not? Um, it sounds like you don't like these little, little, uh, tiny clicky uh, laptop inspired kind of keyboards though. Right. Right, right. Yeah, it's not your not your favorite thing. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I I can't not without us going through a very long diagnosis of what what kind of keyboards you like and what kind of keyboards you don't like. I feel like uh, the best thing I can do is point you to the Wire Cutter, where they've got some excellent okay. excellent articles. Just go to thewirecutter dot com and search for keyboards, and you'll find a bunch of different articles about it. And then see if there's something that's in the ballpark of what you like. I think I think with keyboards you'll narrow it down. You'll be like, I do want a number pad, or I don't want a number. Pad. I don't want Bluetooth, uh -huh. or I don't I don't care. And then if you okay. need to get a Windows keyboard, it'll work. There's software, including the stuff that's built into your Mac, that will um, that'll let you flip the keys around to be the right way to behave. Even if the labels don't look right, they'll behave exactly like they do on the Mac. Got it. Okay. Well, you've, you've really... Uh, I My main question was I didn't know if another keyboard would actually function on, on my iMac. So you've answered my question Absolutely. and you've given me... Lots of tools. So I will go to wirecutter.com. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for calling. That is, I, I, I think we, I think we did a solid there for Gina. And it's true. Uh, one of the amazing things that I've learned over the years in terms of technology stuff is how many people use the thing that you, uh, you got with your computer and you don't ever try to buy anything new. And the default is powerful. This is why more people on iPhone use Apple Maps than Google Maps. You've got to go download Google Maps and launch it. And we can say, well, it's so much better in Google Maps. People don't do it. They just don't do it. And 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 you don't have to be stuck with the default. And if you're a an Apple user or even a PC user and you are using the default keyboard, there are other keyboards. I think if you type a lot, you know, keyboard's a super important tool in you doing your job. You really ought to... Uh, ought to get a good one and you can they're all they're all usb or bluetooth now they're all interchangeable and if they do have some weird keys there are utilities on both operating systems that'll let you remap i you can use any bluetooth keyboard in the world with an ipad too or or your phone honestly your smartphone will use a bluetooth keyboard if you want there's plenty of keyboards in the sea choose one that makes you happy let's go to a fellow jason jason in san pedro california jason hello how are you doing? Uh, uh, finding a fellow, a fellow Jason. I'm in my 50s, so there was no Jasons when I grew up. No, you were right before the Jason wave. I was on the crest of the Jason wave, I have to admit. Uh, oh, 70s? Yeah. Really quick, because we're coming up to a break. What's your yeah. question? Okay. Um, I, ha um, I have a Windows uh, machine and um, an iPad Air. And um, I sync my entire iTunes um, from the machine uh, onto the iPad. Yeah. And then the, uh, my machine broke down and I can't get back to the I iTunes um, on the tower machine. So what I wanted to find out is if I can force, because that's my whole library, if I can just force my library onto my um, iTunes on my Windows 10 um, wow. iTunes. So you need to pull on the, on the laptop. You need to pull stuff back off of your iPad onto your PC. Is that right? Right, right. I want, I want where I point it. I want that to be the library, or uh, and to kill anything, and it can kill anything on that library. I don't care. 
Yeah. On the laptop. So there are there are util- so, so the challenge is you can get the files off the iPad. Um, that I that I, I'm looking at a, a an app that I always used to use on my iPod called Sanuti S E N U T I, which is actually iTunes spelled backward. I'm not uh-huh. sure whether it works the iPad or just the iPod, but if you if you search, um, there are. Uh, there, there are other, um, there are other programs out there too. There's one called Tunes Go. If you search around, you will find software that will let you pull it off. Problem is, it'll probably just pull off the files. So you're going to have to reconstruct your library. I think you're going to lose your, probably lose your playlist. You might be able to recover, recover your playlist too. So you're going to need third-party software, and it's going to cost a little bit of money probably. But you can um, you can extract that stuff back off. Apple makes it hard because they don't want you to like drag your files back and, and use it as a vehicle for piracy. But it can be done. Um, yeah, check out um, check out Sanuti, oh, okay. and okay. Uh, and if it won't do it for you, I think they've got some links there to some other utilities. But uh, y- y- they can be saved, so you're going to be okay. All right, Jason, thank you for the call. Jason Snell here for Leo eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo. We'll be back in a little bit. Hey, Chris Marquardt, photo guy. How are hey, you? Hey, how are you? It's good to see you. How are you? We're <laughs> we're interrupting, and I feel bad, but thank you, Jason Snell, for letting us interrupt uh, with a little photo segment. And and the reason we're doing this is I recorded this ahead of time because you're out of town this week, as am I. So yeah, that a, makes it a bit difficult. <laughs> it's a little extra, Leo and Chris, for your uh, for your day. What do you want to talk about today? Well, if, have you ever tried street photography? Yes, and I'm terrible That's, at it. It's my favorite thing to do. And it's and, and, it, and it makes for really strong photos. If you have people in your photos, that's a general kind of thing. If you, it's 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 awesome if you shoot landscapes and architecture and flowers and things because they don't run away, you know. But getting people in the shots just makes them stronger shots. And the first impulse that you might go for when you try this for the first time is to use what we call a long lens a telephoto lens a yes. lens that that way that lets I can <laughs> sneak up on them and they'll never know I'm taking their picture exactly that that gives you a bit of a safety distance but um, let me let me try to make a point why why I think a focal length around 50 35 to 50 millimeter might be a better choice for street photography now, uh, the first thing is, I mean, and you of course also have the other side. That would be the wide angle, which is like very short, uh, so-called short focal lengths. But then if you use that, well, you have a lot in the frame. So your subject doesn't get the importance that it needs. So that is also not the right side of things. Um, the other thing that you will do when you use a focal length Around the 50 millimeter range, and if you have a if you have a camera that has interchangeable lenses, that's what you want to go for. Um, if you use a micro four thirds camera, you just have that value, so 25 millimeters would be a good focal length there. And the reason I kind of prefer that for street photography is it's not too far away. You will not be too far away when you take that photo, and that makes the whole scene feel more like you're there. This is the general problem with uh, long focal lengths is they have this, they, the pictures convey that feeling of someone watching someone with uh, with binoculars. Spying you know, you have this. Yeah. It's more of a spy kind it's of shot, more of a shot. paparazzi kind of yeah. shot, you know. And even though now, you're zoomed in, it's like you're close, you can tell there's something flattening about a telephoto it lens. It feels, yeah, it feels weird. I used one and the other the day is true. for Michael's graduation, because I wanted to be able to get him on stage, but, but all the shots I took looked like I was spying on them. It was not good. And on the other hand, if you use a very short, a very wide-angle lens, then you will get this weird, distorted feeling. So that is also yeah, not but, a okay, good thing. Chris, and, I got a question for you. Because most sure. people are going to use their camera phone, which isn't a camera phone like 28 millimeters effectively. It's a wide, wide-ish angle lens, right? It is, it is. Is but it no good for a street photography? No, no, it will work for street photography. Now you want to switch off the sound maybe just to not alert people to, to yeah. very loud sounds. But, but it will do the job. It will do the job. 28, I think that's kind of from my personal taste, kind of the lower end of the, the street photography range. Okay. Another reason why I kind of like these medium medium zoom factors is you you kind of restore the balance of power. Because when you 
take a long telephoto lens, there is an in imbalance of power between you and the subject. You are oh, yeah. far away. You have yeah. all that power to take that photo. The other person will, yeah. Not they, to they mention can't do it looked like you worked it. for the NSA spying on them. That might be a problem too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on the other hand, when you use a very short focal length, a very wide angle uh, lens, then you will be in their face and that might also be counterproductive. So again, that range somewhere in the middle is is for me kind of the perfect range to shoot street photos. Now, I want to just briefly talk about how to do it. I mean, how do you get someone, how do you get a photo of someone uh, out in the street? And I'm, I'm including people that you know, I'm including your friends, kind of candid shots when you're around your friends and they kind of not, usually don't want to be uh, photographed, but then you just take some sneaky shots. But here, here's kind of the, the, the way to do this. Um, and that is what we call the focus trap. Have you ever heard of that? No, what's that? You, what, what you do is, and it's, it's not kind of, it's not taken How much does that cost? Where can I buy a focus trap? That's what I need. It's in your camera. Oh. It's, it comes <laughs> with the camera. Oh, shoot. I like so, to buy camera gear. <laughs> <laughs> so what you do is you set up you, you pretty much switch the autofocus of your camera off and set it to manual focus. I know that's scary, but just nice. do it. Yeah. Um, you set it to manual focus and then you focus that lens to some place that is at a distance that you can remember, kind of, let's say, six feet. That's a good distance for these kind of okay. photos. All right. All so right. You, six feet, uh, if, yeah. you don't have a, if you don't have a distance ring on your camera to choose that, you want to use the autofocus, focus on something that's six feet away, and then switch it to manual focus and just leave it there. Second thing is choose an aperture um, that is not too wide open. Okay. So we're talking something like f8 probably. And you can do this by using the aperture priority mode in your camera. Some cameras call it the AV mode, some cameras call it the A mode, where you will set the aperture. Again, f8 is a good, a good, again, a medium value that will give you depth of field, that will give you uh, the sharpness in your photo that people will be in focus. So in other no words, matter, even if they're not exactly six feet away, exactly. it'll still look like They can like be six feet focus. away, they can be seven feet okay. away, they can be five feet away, and in that range, you will still get them in focus. So all you now have to do is point in the general direction, wait till they are in that range and take the photo. And the camera won't take any time to take the photo. The camera is already focused. It doesn't have to focus. The camera knows what aperture is working on, so it doesn't have to do any guesswork there. You might want to raise the ISO a bit so you get shorter f shutter speed so the, the, the photos won't get any camera shake. Just You just shoot it. Boom, exactly. Boom, boom. You don't even have All to aim have to it, do is, really. Just kinda... You have to eyeball the whole thing. <laughs> And you will get in focus people in your photos. They will be um, just perfectly fine. They will be well exposed because the camera will still kind of do its exposure magic. And then, yeah. The great, the old great street them. photographers used to have a saying, F8 and be there. And that's all you need to do to get great street shots. And it is kind of right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, F8, set it for six feet, and then just spray shoot, just walking around, taking pictures. You never know. What a good project for today. Now, we have an assignment, don't we? I forgot to mention our assignment. What is our assignment? Uh, our current assignment is take. Take. Okay, i got to write that down. Take. Because I'm going to be taking take. some pictures, but I think you maybe want something more than just me taking pictures. Well, so I take come up with take is, one of, again, one of these words that has a, an enormous amount of meaning, so you can pretty much choose what you want i'm gonna be uh i'm gonna be uh, back next week and, and maybe i'll take some pictures when i'm on vacation of people I'm taking things to those. or take two or something i'll figure <laughs> it out the way to participate is you know this isn't a competition this is for fun it's an excuse to get out there and take pictures uh, go out and shoot some pictures upload your favorite every week to our tech guy group it's on Flickr. you need to be a Flickr member at flickr.com the Tech Guy group is a big group. You'll know you're there. There's a picture of me, and there's like 11,000 people. Renee Silverman, our moderator, will welcome in into the group and welcome your submission. And, uh, you know, maybe next week or the week after, uh, Chris will pick a few of the best and talk about them on the show. It's a kind That's of the plan. Just to get out there and take photos. Chris, thank you so much. You'll find uh, Mr. Marquardt and all his, uh, all his photo expeditions and workshops at discoverthetopfloor.com. We'll have more with uh, Jason in just a bit, the Tech Guy Show. Thank you, Jason, for filling in. Now, 
Uh, I do want to mention, before I left on vacation, and I'm on the plane right now coming back. Uh, I should be back tomorrow or the next day. Um, I loaded up my iPad with magazines. I have a stack of magazines. It would be this big if I'd gone to the newsstand. But it's not because I use Texture. Texture is Netflix for magazines. It's awesome. You pay less than 10 bucks a month for more than 200 of the best magazines. And they're all on your iPad. Every page that's on the newsstand, the current issue, plus back issues, plus features that you can't do in a magazine like video. Uh, I get Shutterbug and National Geographic, some great photo photographic magazines. And, and they look better on the iPad than they do in print. Much. Because print, you know, they have to screen it. The iPad, you're seeing that image as it was taken. I mean, it's it's so much better. Plus, you know, every month there are articles in a, in a magazine that I want to read in, in uh, you know, so many, like The New Yorker and Rolling Stone and uh, uh, The Atlantic. But I don't, you know, if I were to subscribe to those magazines, I just have a ton of, my coffee table would be collapsed under the weight. And it's expensive. And if I were to go to the newsstand and buy it, that's even worse. So texture is like such a smart idea. There's no waste. It's much more affordable. And I get a huge variety of magazines, including, you know, trade magazines like Billboard, uh, Ad Age, that I probably wouldn't subscribe to because they're really expensive. But I am, you know, it's my business. I love, you know, once in a while dipping into those. Just even seeing what the Hot 100 is on Billboard is fantastic. Look, I think, I, I think texture is the best deal right now in magazines. Wired. Consumer Reports, Fast Company, everything you would want. Go, I'll tell you what, go to look and see. Go to texture.com slash twit. See the magazines. The text is searchable. That's better than print, right? Mark stuff you like. Check out back issues. They have curation. So if you're you know looking for something to read in, in a variety of topics, you're not sure. I'll tell you, now, nowadays we're all reading so much about news and politics. Um, it's celebrity gossip, sports. It's like, I'm sure they got Sports Illustrated. Reading up on the Warriors, it's all in there. I I love my texture, and it's because it's completely digital, it's environmentally friendly, and and it's more affordable. And having a stack of magazines on my phone or on my tablet is amazing. Texture.com/slash/twit. You get a 14-day free trial right now. Texture was selected as uh, one of Apple's top 2016 iPad apps. I I completely agreed with that. I thought, wow, they're that's smart. They're absolutely right. And this 14-day free trial means there's no reason not to try it. You going on vacation this uh, summer? You got to have texture. I would. I'm so glad I had it on the airplane, especially if they start banning laptops. You, you're going to really want texture. Texture.com/slash/twit. Try it free for two weeks. We thank you for their support of the tech guy. And now back to Jason Snell. It's the tech guy. I'm Jason Snell, sitting in for Leah Laporte, who is being whisked home. To do lots of laundry after a big vacation, but he'll be back next week. Happy Father's Day to everybody out there who's a father. Uh, I I uh, I was greeted. I still am getting over getting greeted as a as a father, and I I've got a 15 year old, and yet still, it's an amazing thing to be on a recipient of a Father's Day greeting. So happy Father's Day to everybody out there who qualifies in any way for that term. This is the Tech Guy 8888. Ask Leo. We're gonna answer some more. Of your tech questions, it's something we like to do because there wouldn't be much of a show if we didn't answer your technology questions. Uh, I think we've got a call from Rob in New Jersey. Rob, hello. Hello, hello, hello. It's so nice to get to speak to you. Thank you for uh, waiting, sir. Thank you. No problem. My pleasure. Uh, okay, so this is the situation. My daughter has an iPhone 7, and uh, she's taking my grandson to... Uh, Disney and uh, going on a cruise with him and a whole bunch of different things and she takes a lot a lot of pictures and she enjoys doing that and then she winds up sending it to us as grandparents any case um, uh, one of the things we were looking and, and we bought was uh, we bought for her a um, one of these uh, power bank extenders you know and uh, but it's very inconvenient when you're going with a eight-year-old and uh, you've got other things to do. And so I, in doing some research, I found that there are power bank cases that are extended batteries, basically, but that plug right into the actual unit. So you don't have to carry a second unit. Um, 
uh, if you do carry the second unit, then to and you're out to in order to recharge it, you got to plug it in and you got to wait for it to do this. But the extended battery case seems to seems to, and that's why I'm calling you. Seems to be as soon as you get yours down to practically nothing, you can just hit a button and since it's already connected and part of the unit, it, you start to use the power there. So yep. if that is correct, and you're saying, yep, so yes. I appreciate that. So now what I'm looking for is a recommendation. Obviously, I want the biggest unit that we could get um, that would hook on to it, uh, and give us the most, um, you know, the most... Uh, Power so that she could she could use it for a length of time rather than and then when she gets home or back to the hotel or wherever she is she can plug it in and I did see a couple of different brands some of which say they're MFI uh, right made for iPhone okay so uh, that's what it means okay yes thank you you answered the first question um, should I stick with one that says MFI that's the first question. And second question is, uh, do you have a particular brand or one that you know of that would, uh, you know, be fairly large and and um, and that you would recommend? Yeah, sure. Uh, there are a few different uh, options here. I think one of the uh, tried and true third party uh, iPhone case battery case makers is mophi m-o-p-h-i-e and they have a product for the iphone 7 called the juice pack air and that is a reputable vendor and they've got um i think that's a made for iphone because they are a reputable vendor i think that's even sold in in apple stores it um you know you put it on it does make your whole phone bigger and heavier but you will be able to use uh, you know or or uh your, your family member will be able to use it for a very long time uh, without losing battery. Apple also makes a battery case that's that's nice called the iPhone 7 smart battery case. But most of the people I know who are really hardcore about using getting the most out of iPhone uh, usage when they're roaming will choose the Mophie. So I would look at that. I would also say, depending on how she uses her iPhone when she's traveling... Uh, what she's carrying with her. If it's literally just a phone in a pocket, then the the case is going to be the, make the most sense because she's not going to want to mess with anything else. But I am a big believer in battery packs because they're more flexible. Um, you can keep it in a bag or a purse and then plug it into your phone when you need it and then unplug it again, sort of top up. And if you've got enough flexibility that you've got another bag or even another pocket to keep that external battery ca- battery in instead of a battery case, I find that that works, uh, that works pretty well. And uh, those will last because they don't, they don't care what device you're charging. They'll, they'll charge this iPhone and the next one no matter how it's shaped. And that's pretty nice. So it depends on what's more convenient for her. For a lot of people, having it on the case is the most convenient thing. But for some people, they, they, they're going to have a place that they can store that, that battery pack away and then bring it out when they need it. And the rest of the time, their phone is a, a normal size and not the sort of big battery pack phone size that the, that the Mophie case will make it. So it sort of depends on uh, what she wants. But there are good options for both. And I think both are valid. It really depends on if you're somebody who wants to commit to having a kind of heavier, thicker, bigger phone in order to get that super long battery life. Because that Mophie case, you can use that, that phone all day, like 24 hours a day, and it will last. Okay. Well, uh, of these, the separate battery packs, any particular ones that you know of that you would recommend? Well, I am going to defer to the good people at the Wire Cutter, which is my go-to technology recommendation site. They made a bunch of recommendations. I use I use an Anker charger, A N K E R is the name of that company. But Wire Cutter right now is recommending a battery called the Jackery Bolt. So the company is J A C K E R Y Jackery, and they also have a a, a couple. All these companies make a lot lots of different battery packs for different uses. So the wire cutter likes the Jackery Bolt, which is $27, which is pretty good. Uh, my Anchor one that I bought was about $30. And, it, you know, it's small enough to put in a pocket or certainly to put in a purse or a bag. I, I will often be walking around a conference when I'm, I'm wandering around with my phone for a very long time. And I will have my phone in my front right, front left pocket, as I always do, and I'll have a cable running from my front pocket to my back pocket, which is where I've kept, I've tucked that battery. 
And, uh, you know, it, it seems silly, and it is silly, but it does work, and it'll recharge that. And as soon as it's recharged, it'll do it pretty fast. Then you can put that battery pack anywhere and tuck it away again, which is the nice thing about it. So it depends on what she wants, but there are plenty of options, and I, I think they'll serve her pretty well. Okay. She does have one of the out-of-box cases on the iPhone now. So um, I would imagine that the, the best way is to do what you had suggested, just a separate battery pack. And that would give a bigger a bigger number of um, a, what are the milliamps or whatever it yeah. is to charge, right? It would give me more, give her more flexibility. Yeah, it's definitely more flexibility. The, the, those battery cases can have pretty big batteries on them. It depends on how, you know, they have to balance giving your phone lots of battery recharge versus getting heavier and thicker because that definitely happens. But if she's got an OtterBox case that she really likes, I, I could go either way. I mean, it may be that the Mophie case, uh, if she swaps that in for the OtterBox case when she's traveling, it won't feel very different, but she could leave her case on and use one of these external packs. If she, I, I think the real question is if she's going around... Uh, uh, an amusement park or something like that, a theme park, and uh, doesn't want to have another thing to carry, then put the case solves that where she's just carrying her phone. But if she does have a purse or a backpack or something like that, uh, the external case, so it's so flexible because it could charge anybody's phone. You know, if you've got a couple of phones, you just plug it into one and then plug it into another one later and, and, and you get a new phone that's shaped differently and you can plug that one in. And, and so it's just much more flexible. Great, great. Now, I think the, I looked up and I think I did see the anchor and the jackery and but I think both neither one of those say that it's uh, MFI yeah, certified. The, so the MFI program is is generally about if you've got a lightning cable on it that is directly attaching to the iPhone and most of these outside battery ca battery packs what they do is they have a USB either an old style USB A or a USB C plug on them and you bring your own cable so you just bring your iPhone charging cable and plug it into the USB on the battery and then plug the other end into your phone and that's kind of nice because that way it'll work with an iPhone if you've got somebody with an Android phone and they've got a plug that is the same plug that's on your battery they can charge too um, and some some of them some of the bigger ones will even have two USB ports on them and you can charge two devices at once so they don't need to be made for iPhone really because they're just uh, pr providing USB power and then you bring your own cable. Okay. Now, when when you plug it in, when you plug in these separate battery packs, because I have one also that I use for um, for my Android, uh, Android phone, um, then in order to charge it up, though, you have to plug it in and it's not a very quick kind of charge to get power in there. Or can you just leave it plugged in and just use it that way? Yeah, you can just leave it plugged in and use that. I will do that sometimes. And I will admit it's not the most attractive thing in the world to be using your phone while there's a cable dangling and running into another pocket or into a purse or something. But you can do it, and it works pretty well. And, again, it depends on how how uh, how much you care about somebody looking at you and saying, oh, his phone is plugged in. But yeah, having your phone plugged in isn't too unreasonable. Everybody has battery issues. We're going to take a break. It's the Tech Guy, 888-8-ASK-LEO. We'll be back. You're out. And we're out. That was a good question. There are a lot of questions. The chat room has so many, uh, so many opinions about about these things. But it's funny. Like, if you really care, like you're using it all the time, you're always needing a recharge. It totally makes sense to get a case. If if it's if it's literally all the time. For me, in my everyday life, I don't need a recharge on my phone during the day. I'm fine. But when I go to a conference or something, I bring one of those little batteries with me and I just keep it around in my backpack or if I'm going somewhere without my backpack in a pocket. And yeah, it's one other thing to carry, but it's so much more flexible. It'll charge an iPad. It'll charge your phone. It'll charge somebody else's phone. Yeah, you got to bring a cable, but I think I, I, I'm a big fan of the flexibility because the fact is you invest so much in an iPhone 6 battery case and then you get an iPhone 7 and or an iPhone 8 and it changes and, and the battery case is still perfectly good and you can't use it anymore because the shape is wrong. And for power, it's just power. And, you know, USB-C or USB, there are some high power ones for USB-C and like um, high power charging, fast charging that are coming out now. Um, and if your phone does that, then those are awesome because they'll charge it that much faster. Um, it really depends. But I don't know. I don't mind. Yes, I am that guy who's walking around a convention with a, uh, a white iPhone charging cable coming out of one pocket and snaking around and going in another pocket. I should just get a belt. I should get a belt. 
that is is bandolier. is just a oh a bandolier wouldn't be bad. I was thinking just like a a lightning belt. <laughs> but yeah, it's true. I could do that. Um, I'm sure they make that. I'm sure they make all that. I'm sure Scott Evest makes like a battery hat, something like that. Again, I'm here at Twit. Smart hats are the future. Smart hats. I've been spending a lot of time here at Twit. I don't live here. I live down the road a pace, but they uh, asked me to come by, fill in for Leo. And uh, I always know when Leo's going on vacation because I get a call when he's booking his vacation, his plans. I get a call. You want to guest host some shows? I'm like, yeah, of course. Happy to do it. Love being on Twit. Hosting show, a little more stressful, but I've hosted shows before. I can do it. This is the high degree of difficulty one. I appreciate the vote of confidence. I, I might have to do like a double back flip kind of dive later for the real high scores from the judges, but uh, it's going okay. A um, lot of speculation in the chat room about the ultimate Batman utility belt for mobile. I'm sure somebody makes that, but and I'm sure Andy Anatko, quite frankly, has built that, although it may be a bandolier instead, but uh, something like that for sure. And uh, we're going to be going back to Rob in New Jersey, who I hung up on because we had to go to a break, and that was bad form because he had another question. And we'll do it. We'll talk about it. We can make it happen, but that's going to be in a few minutes. Um, I am being endlessly asked questions about Android in the chat room, which is hilarious since I am not much of an Android user. I have a Nexus 5X at home. That is my reference Android system. Um, one of the questions is, if you were given a free Android phone, would you want the Galaxy S8 or the high-end Pixel? And my answer would be, I'd take the high-end Pixel because I would really prefer to be running stock Android and not Samsung's stuff. And that's just me. Like, I like Android. I uh, think Google has done uh, an amazing job advancing that platform. Samsung stuff it's never really impressed me um, on the software side. The hardware stuff is impressive, but... Um, the faith I have in, in Samsung's add-on stuff is none. Is none. So maybe I'll have to give it a try again at some point, but I would. I think I would prefer to just go with a, that pure Google experience if I had to choose. But again, I'm an iPhone guy. Come on. Like, you know, actually, one of the things that, that um, people don't talk about so much that is a true um, uh wall brick in the walled garden i don't know use your own metaphor here platform retaining tool is this apple watch i got the pride band by the way rainbows who doesn't like rainbows six color rainbows also no strangers to apple um apple watch i love my apple watch i wear it all the time guess what the apple watch doesn't work with android so even when i want to use android i'm not just like switching to android to try it out i have to give up my apple watch to do it which is painful for me makes it harder so it's, uh, people, I, I worry that I've overstated. I, I love getting the audience on my side. I worry I've overstated a little bit. There are, there, it, this is a very complex situation, but everybody being very kind and complimentary in the chat room. How strange. I don't know how to take that. Thank you. You're being very generous. Um, this is the most, this is the one aspect of Leo's job that has, that has changed the least because it's the radio connection. He can't redefine it. I mean, Leo will not talk about this so much because, you know, he he doesn't love to talk about a lot of the 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 this this sort of stuff about him building his business. But he sort of redefined what a TV show and a, a radio show look like on the internet with Twit. And over the years, they have built this whole process that m works really well for internet content. And this show's a little bit different because it is on the radio, the actual radio, terrestrial broadcast radio in in the U.S. and maybe Canada too. And it's uh, and so it's different. It's it's like the same as when he started doing it in the cottage. Um, and it, it's yeah, it's 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 actually kind of cool. I could see how you do this a few times and you totally get into the swing of it. I'm just uh, I'm learning the ropes. I didn't know where the uh, shift pedal was there. My daughter is a student driver. I feel a little like a student driver. You're live. Welcome, welcome, everyone, back to the Tech Guy Live. I am Jason Snell, most definitely not Leo Laporte, but filling in for Leo. He is on assignment. His assignment is to, t to get a little bit of rest and do his laundry. Coming back from a vacation, he'll be back next week from a very long and epic vacation, is my understanding. Now, we uh, last spoke to Rob in New Jersey, 
and uh, Rob is back for more. Rob, thank you so much for persevering. Sorry about the uh, the quick cutoff last time. I believe you had uh, one more question. Yes, I do. Thank you very much for uh, for getting me back. Um, um, my, uh, we were talking about the iPhone, and uh, my my daughter also has, as well as my wife, uh, a number of iPod touches. And uh, uh, before she got the iPhone, uh, they filled 64 gigs up like five or six times with photos of my grandson. All right, so we've been using i I think it's called IE Drive as a cloud, uh, you know, a cloud storage or a duplicate or a backup because. Um, uh, they have a couple of iPod touches that are have old operating systems, and what they told me and what turned out to be very practical, if you upgrade the iOSs from, let's say, 7 to 8 or 9 or 10, that you potentially, and that did happen, lose a lot of the photos. So I don't want to lose any of the photos. But the, the iDrive, the IE Drive, I think it's called, um, will copy the fold, the photos along with the folders that we have. And when you have uh, 20 or 30 gigs of photos, if you created folders, you don't want to lose them. Now, I'm wondering, does Google Photos have, uh, when it copies them, does it copy and copy the folders, or is it just going to copy the photos? I think Google Photos will only copy the photos. I don't think they're going to pick up your albums from iOS. I don't, not a hundred percent on that. Don't don't. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to give you bad advice, but I I think it won't. Um, and if you've got the, it's tough. It's tough to retain all that stuff. I think if you imported them onto a Mac or PC with a big enough hard drive, you could import them. And have the folders that's possible, and then you could sync that with like iCloud Photo Library. But Google Photos, I think you'll probably lose your organization, and that's something that that happens with a lot of these things. When Apple went from iPhoto to Photos, a lot of the organizational stuff went away. Not all of it, but some of it. So, um, ba backing them up to another device or to the cloud is a good thing to do. Um, and Google Photos will let you back up a whole lot, which is great. But um, you may that may be a trade off is that you may have to do some some reorganization. Okay, so <clears throat> that's going to be very very inconvenient if you have uh, over a hundred, which over a hundred gigabyte of photos. Yeah. So are they are they backed up on the in the cloud right now? Are they backed up to iCloud or are they backed up onto a hard drive or something? They're backed up to this thing called IE Drive. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but. Um, it's uh, a cloud-based storage that um, that will back up the folders as well as it's almost like a a true cloning, you know, of the of the uh, iPhone or i uh, right. or iPod, so that it's copying both the folders as well as the camera roll or the albums as well as the camera roll. Which makes it very convenient yeah. when you have a huge number. If you don't have very many, it doesn't make much of a difference. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. I think that's the challenge is if you can find a cloud backup service that will that my my gut feeling is that if you can get those iPod touches especially or or that cloud drive to back up to iCloud photo library and pay for um, some storage on iCloud photo library, you've got a better chance of being able to get your albums and stuff to sync with them because Apple has has done a pretty good job of that or importing them into photos and then exporting them out but the the danger of all of these things is if you do your organizational structure inside of uh, one particular app or one particular service and then you need to move one of the ways they keep you there is they make it very hard or impossible to get your stuff out or they don't even build that feature so um, thank you for the call we're going to move on to another call and this one is from Stephen in Los Angeles. Stephen, hello. Hi, and thank you for taking my call. Thanks for calling. I have um, an older um, MacBook Pro, and I've installed Windows 8.1 on it. I did that some time ago. Uh, at this point in time, I'd like to uninstall it and regain um, the space 
that was on the um, on, on the MacBook Pro prior to that. It's only got like 250 gig on it. Right. And I'm, I'm trying to find a way to uh, regain that space. And I'm not quite sure how to do it. All right. So there's a way it should work. And there's maybe the way that it you, you might need to make it work. <laughs> so let's take the way it should work. So when you install Boot Camp, right, one of the things that happens is you get this utility called the Boot Camp Assistant that lives in your utilities folder inside the applications okay. folder. You should be able to open Boot Camp Assistant on that computer and um, kind of click through until you get the chance to remove uh, the Windows partition. You can like create or remove the Windows partition. So you um, you go through the introduction, you select create or remove a Windows partition, um, you click restore to remove the Windows partition, and what it should do is let you restore the disk to just your Mac partition. So in an ideal world, the Boot Camp Assistant, and you may need to click around a little bit to get to the right place, it should be able, one of the things it's supposed to assist you with is just wiping out your Windows partition. Um, if, okay, now, yep, does, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry for interrupting. Does the Boot Camp work on the Windows side or on the Mac side? It's on the Mac side. Are you? Do you only have Windows on there or do you have both? No, no, no. I have both. All right. So it should be in on the Mac side. You should be able to go in the Applications folder in Utilities and find Boot Camp Assistant, which should have been installed there when you went through Boot Camp back in the first place to get it going. And you should be able to remove it from there. And what it'll do is it'll remove that Windows partition entirely. It's like it's erasing the disk, basically. And then it will try to enlarge your Mac partition to be the full size of the disk again. Um, okay. I've tried this, and sometimes it doesn't work. So the other thing you can do if that fails is to use the disk utility, which is also in that utilities folder, and delete just delete the Windows partition and reformat it as a Mac partition. But Boot Camp does some weird things to your boot drive on a Mac uh, in order to get the dual boot with Windows, and it leads to some weird problems if you wipe out that, that Boot Camp partition via disk utility. So try to do it from Boot Camp Assistant. It should let you do it. But if not, um, the worst case scenario, I feel like, is that you'll end up with a second partition. So you'll have to, like... Ideally, you'd have one partition on your disk, and you can have the full everything on your disk in one place. But it's possible you'll end up with two partitions if you have to use disk utility and then kind of stick files on partition A or partition B. But ideally, you won't have to. Ideally, Boot Camp Assistant will just wipe that partition, expand your Mac partition, and you'll be good to go with your whole drive again. Okay. Now, I have uh, a lot of documents and a lot of pictures on my MacBook Pro on the Mac side. Am I going to lose them? No, you, you. I mean, you should always have a backup whenever you do. But, and I know changing a partition on a drive that you're using is super scary. Ideally, what the bootcamp assistant is doing is it's touching the Windows partition. That's all it's doing, and then resizing the partition should just be tacking that space onto the existing partition. So it should be okay. But that said, you, you if you've got key documents that you're afraid of losing and something like this, back them up first because you should be backing up. A, a, backing them up anyway, but this would be a great opportunity to have that, uh, that file backup that, uh, that you're looking for um, before you delete the partition. Tech Guy, live, 8888-ASK-LEO. We'll be back shortly. You're out. So, Stephen, we are off the air. Do you have any other, but we're still on the podcast. Do you still have any other questions or did I, did, did we get there? I think he's gone. All right. I guess he doesn't have any more questions. You know, I was talking to my mom the other day, and she has... Leo's voice appears from the radio side. Fascinating. What a what a world we live in. Um, yeah. Did, chat room, did you know what he was talking about when he was saying IE drive? Because I don't know what he was talking about um, as a backup service for photos. I don't know if he means like iDrive. I really couldn't. I really couldn't tell. Um, they do have a mobile backup on iDrive. My my gut feeling is that they should try to use iCloud Photo Library, but I'm not sure those iPod Touches can go up to iOS nine. And my other gut feeling is sync them. Yeah, <laughs> chat room saying I think it's iDrive. I think it's eDrive. Well, yeah, 
that's the question, right? Is like IE drive isn't a thing. Um, so which one is it? Um, since they're on, unless they're building, I mean, is he building his photo folders up on the on the cloud in in E drive or iDrive? If so, I think there's no hope. But if if the folders are on on photos or iPhoto or they're on those i those uh, iPod touches, there might be a way to get that that data out of them. I don't know. Yes, IE for example drive. <laughs> That's it. It's a successor to EG Drive, and it's definitely not Internet Explorer Drive. Good Lord. That'd be Edge Drive now, right? Totally different. Um, what do we have coming up? We've got some some questions coming up. Um, we got an Apple Pencil question coming up. That's exciting. We've got a problematic Thunderbolt display. Oh, that's going to be bad news, I think. I worry about that. Um I don't know what the color bar question is at all, so that's fascinating. And uh, Windows XP question, I am deathly afraid I'm not going to be able to answer that one. Although the short answer is, if you have Windows XP, yes, you should you should run all the updates on it because you're going to get hacked and then you should not use XP anymore. That's the short version of that. So what... Is it? It's 117. All right. Your life passes before your eyes when you're sitting here. Okay, we're going to go to Don and then Rodney, maybe. It's exciting being here. So, yeah, um, I wish we knew whether it was iDrive or eDrive. Did you? I don't know if you noticed, too, that it sounded like. Um, like our caller in was it the caller in New Jersey who, uh, or maybe it was maybe it was the last caller that, that there was clearly somebody next to them telling them telling him what to ask. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Like, hey, you're on the phone with the with the tech radio show. What what do you want me to ask? Ah, uh, that's pretty funny. I don't know the the tragedy of so many of these photo services is you do you do all your photo photo organization in them and then they die or you have to get out of them and you just lose it that that happened to me i lost all sorts of tagging at one point it's just that, that's why they're doing all the machine learning stuff now is at least that can be rerun at least you can just retrain faces and get all your photos of the people you know back whether you're using google or apple or some other service um, but I used to manually tag every photo I had, and that stuff is gone. I mean, I, th I think I have it backed up on a CD-ROM somewhere, CDR. Never going to look at those. My emergency photo backups from five years ago, ten years ago. It's not going to happen. Tech Guy Live. I'm Jason Snell sitting in for Leo Laporte, who is washing his clothes now i think finally doing his vacation laundry he'll be back next week but we've still got people to help here on the tech guy let's go to don in la hi don thanks for calling hello hi don oh hi i'm sorry i didn't hear what city you said um hi jason i have a thunderbolt display that uh turns off randomly I understand that that may be a heating problem with the cord. I'm wondering how difficult the repair is. Maybe somebody in the uh, in the chat room has an idea if you're not sure. Yeah, one of the problems with that Thunderbolt display is that it's uh, it's basically a little computer in there because it's got its whole Thunderbolt hub and uh, its own power source and its own fan and things like that, which makes it pretty complicated. And I used to have one of those, and I loved it. Um, I, I, I worry that there's no easy fix. Um the, I, I, I'm hesitant to tell you to go to Apple to have them look at it because uh, that diagnosis may be um, unfortunate and expensive. Although it's possible that you could go if you've got a local uh, Apple uh, repair shop, they might be able to look at it. But the challenge with that display is it's so unique. It's not like a regular display anymore. That there, I, I worry that there's something really technically wrong that's going to require an Apple fix. And yeah. depend, depending on the cost... Um, it might be actually, you know, not much more expensive to get a new monitor at that point. So I don't know. I, I don't have a quick answer for you because I, I, I know that display pretty well and it's, it's great, but it's also like a one of a kind where Apple made that one Thunderbolt display and put a lot of interesting technology in it. So I, I don't, 
uh, you know, I, I, my 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 hope is that maybe if you found like a local repair shop, they might be able to look who's who's who does Apple stuff. They might be able to look at it. Um, it might be worth a diagnosis at the Apple store if you've got one nearby and they're willing to look at it. Yeah, I've done you know at seventy two. I've done some interesting things by watching YouTube videos. And I'm not afraid to open uh, things, but as I understand this particular repair, the connection, connecting the new cable once you get it, is not just plugging it in. Yeah, it's there. there it probably. I think I know what you're talking about. It's probably pretty scary. Um, but that that's why again I recommend if you've got uh, some. Uh, I don't want to denigrate it by saying hole in the wall, but more like a, a, a hidden gem of a Mac repair shop. There are those people, you know, there's like, oh, there's that guy who does all the all the Mac repairs and he's not the Apple store, but you can go to him for your older stuff. If you've got somebody like that and ask around, if you don't know, um, ask your other people in your area who use Macs, if they've got a, a, a repair person that they know, because that person may be much more comfortable at making that repair and may have already made it before, especially if there are YouTube videos about it. It's probably in the Water that he probably has heard about it before, and he may be able to help you. So I think that might be your best bet is to is to do that. See if you can find a good kind of independent Mac tech and uh, and see if they can they can throw you a lifeline. Yeah, this is this is LA, so almost everybody pretty much wants to be paid. Yeah, uh, well, well that, anyway, that's that's uh, true, I but it might be it, it might be. You're being there. I just thought maybe somebody in the chat room might have done the repair before, or had knew somebody that did, and if it, if they haven't then it's more complicated than I want to take on. Yeah. So, we've answered, the, so we, we've answered the question. All right. Well, thank you very much for calling. Um, yeah, the the chat room, our good friends in the chat room, uh, have similar advice, it seems like, to, to mine, which is um, find somebody who will... Uh, who will do a single fee charge if they fix it, PC guy says, or no payment for service. Yeah, ideally you'd find somebody to uh, to diagnose it for you. And uh, and and I mean, I my um, what is my my father in law and mother in law their iMac had like ants coming out of it at one point, <laughs> and they found in Orange County they found a really great Apple tech who um, who took their iMac apart and cleaned it up and got it working again. And uh, they're out there. They didn't have to go to the Apple store for the ant infestation, which is good because the Apple store actually took one look at it and said, no, no, if there are ants crawling out of it, we won't touch it. So. Uh, which I don't blame them for, quite frankly. I don't think I would have wanted to touch it either. And if I'd been there, they would have made me because I'm the son-in-law. Let's go to Rodney. Rodney, you're on the air. What's your question? Hi. Um, I'm planning to buy a new iPad. Mm -hmm. iPad Pro, the 10-inch one. But I want to know, do I have to buy? Yeah, I do a lot of artwork, and I'm, I was planning to buy the, the Wacom 16 inch but um, I saw the iPhone spread Pro 10 inch, mm -hmm. and I want to know, uh, do I have to buy that expensive pencil, or is there a substitution for that, that pencil that uh, you have to buy to draw with iPad Pro? Right, right. Okay, so the question is about the Apple Pencil, which is, I, I want to say it's $99. Does that sound right? It's not cheap. Um right. And it only works with the iPad Pro. As with a lot of Apple stuff, the answer is sort of you get what you pay for. Apple, because they built it themselves, not only are they charging more for it, but they've got it way more integrated into the operating system. So it, it, it you know, it's Apple's own thing. So they've got the Apple hardware and in the display and the Apple hardware and the pencil. And then they've got the, uh, and then they've got, uh, the software that interprets them all. And they talk to each other. It's not just a regular old stylus. The advanced styluses of today have their own onboard power and processors, and they're sending feedback from the tip of the pen, uh, into the device. Um, so I got to say, um, without reservation, the best stylus for the iPad Pro is the Apple Pencil. But it is, I get it, it's pricey. Um, the um, the 53 uh, Pencil or or whatever it is from, from 53 uh, is the, uh, God, does it have a name? The one, it's the one that, it looks like a, almost like a, like a marker. Um, that one is, yeah, it's just the 53 pencil is 50 bucks. And that was the go-to uh, stylus for the iPad before the Apple Pencil came out. So it's it's uh, it's cheaper. There are some other ones out there. Uh, Navitech makes one that's 40 bucks. 
Um, there are there are some cheaper ones that are in the twenty or thirty buck range. I think the reality, though, Rodney, is that it, it's kind of that story of you get what you pay for, where um, you start to give up things because the Apple stuff's the most expensive, but it does the most. But that fifty three pencil is pretty good. I, I um, all of my friends who drew stuff on the iPad before the Apple pencil came out used it, and at fifty bucks, it's going to be a lot cheaper than the Apple pencil. If that makes sense. Now it is. It- the technology is not like Wacom. Uh, like a like a Wacom. Well, uh, it's similar. I mean, it's all the same. It's all similar tech in the sense that there's um, there's intelligence in the um, well with a Wacom all in one kind of thing. It's uh, the, the 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 stylus and the display are all kind of working together, but it's all doing basically the same thing, which is it's it's pinpointing your placement of the pen on the screen and the movement and the pressure. And putting it all together, and then the software supports it. And at this point, um, I think that all of these smart iPad styluses will give you that in most apps. But you're going to get the most out of the out of the Apple Pencil just because Apple has a home court advantage there. But um, you know, some people will swear by uh, using a Wacom tablet on a on a computer, and it's a it's a different kind of thing. But the iPad Pro at this point, with the 120 hertz refresh and the 240 hertz digitizer so it's actually measuring where your pen is 240 times a second uh it's pretty good on its own you just have to get a stylus for it it's the tech guy we'll be back in a little bit styluses the um you know, the problem is, will it be better to whack them? There's somebody in the chat room saying uh, the pencil works better than the whack them. It l- depends on what you're using it for, right? Like, I've, I've heard a bunch of people say that, that the Wacom approach is better because you can run your apps that you know from the desktop. And iPad especially doesn't do that. It runs iPad apps. By the way, I would really like Adobe to actually just make a, a full-on Photoshop um, for the iPad rather than the kind of eight different Photoshop apps that they currently have. Uh, there is a new app that just came out that I should I should give a plug to while we're talking about this, which is Affinity Photo, um, which is Apple demoed it at the at the WWDC keynote. It's Photoshop. It's it's startling how many features it has, um, layers and adjustments, and it's pretty incredible. And there are others too, like Pixelmator, that um, are pretty amazing. Um, but the the state of affairs on the iPad is. You have a powered, intelligent stylus. It's basically connected by Bluetooth, and it's talking to the display. Because one of the challenges... Okay, graphics tablet nerdery here. It used to be that the graphics tablets were sensitive. Pressure sensitivity was all on the screen. And you could take a dumb stylus. But these days, you know, we can miniaturize technology pretty well. So now what happens is the stylus is smart. And that means the screen can be a little dumber, which is good for a few reasons... Um, because screens are expensive to make and they're hard to make and you don't know if somebody's going to need to use a stylus with it or not. So you put some of the smarts in the stylus and the people who need styluses buy them. The people who don't, don't. And the stylus knows just as well as the screen does how much pressure it's putting down, right? Because they're both feeling the pressure. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. They both feel the pressure. So that today's styluses, that's what's happening is when you're pressing down lightly or, or hard with a stylus on a screen um, with like an Apple Pencil or something like that, um, the pencil is saying, this is how hard I'm pressing. And over Bluetooth is streaming that in real time, along with things like the angle of the pencil to the uh, to the iPad. And the iPad's taking that, plus its location on its digitizer, and it's updating that. And then the wacky thing that these, um, in order to get latency down, which is that thing where you're drawing and you can see that, the, that your pen stroke is behind where your pencil is, which is like totally breaks the illusion, right? Um, They start to do guesses about where you're going. There's like vector guesses that if you're moving at a certain speed in a certain direction, they will draw ahead where they think you're going. And yeah, if you change, they have to kind of like, oop, you know, back up and draw it again. But it's a pretty good illusion. You can get down to like, what, I think it's 10 milliseconds of lag now, which is pretty great. Although it was pointed out to me by my friend John Syracuse on the Accidental Tech Podcast that... um, just going down from 100 uh, to 10, it's great. You did an order of magnitude on your lag. Good job. But if you look at those tests that Microsoft, I think, did of of stylus lag, like 10 to 1 is still noticeable. So 
you got another order of magnitude to cut it. Um, but we may get there. I mean, the idea is just to maintain the illusion that when you're using a computer pencil to draw on a computer screen, it feels like you're drawing with an actual pencil on an actual piece of paper. And we're getting pretty close. So it's pretty awesome. Um, and the Apple Pencil, I'm surprised, it is a pretty amazing piece of technology. Um, but to be fair, there's also the home court advantage that is undeniably true. Apple designs... Um, I mean, the whole stylus experience on the iPad is better than it used to be because Apple finally cared about it because they had a product. But at the same time, Apple is designing now for the Apple Pencil that it built and that it wants to sell you and that it's tying all that stuff together. And other styluses can take advantage to a certain extent, but at the same time, it's the uh, elephant in the room. So um, if you don't want to spend $99 for an Apple Pencil, I don't know, 53's pencil for half the price is probably the way to go. But you could... I'd say if it really matters to you, if like drawing on an iPad really matters, you probably should spring for the Apple Pencil. If you're buying an iPad Pro anyway, I'd factor in the extra $100 because it's going to give you the best experience. And that's just, that's just, that's Apple. It's the Tech Guy Live. I'm Jason Snell sitting in for Leo Laporte, who is on vacation, but is coming back now and he'll be back next week. We're taking your calls, trying to help out. I uh, worked at Macworld for many, many years and write about Apple for the most part, although some other stuff. Uh, I believe our next caller has a question about a version of Windows that even I remember running, and that's Victor in Santa Barbara. Victor, hello. Thank you for taking my call. What is your question, sir? I hope I can help you. I'm not sure if I can, but I will give it my best. Well, look, we have, we have several computers. One of them is an old one still running on Windows XP, and I hear that Microsoft recently issued some, some security updates. And I went to their site, and I think I found the download. I think you would say, hurry up and download it, right? Yeah, that's the, yeah. That's the answer. App, uh, Microsoft actually gave up on Windows XP updates, right? But there was this huge, uh, huge attack on Windows XP computers, especially in the UK at the National Health Service. And, um, and apparently there are some companies that pay Microsoft, and they still get XP updates, but the National Health Service wasn't among them. Um, and after a bunch of pressure and the fact that this is everybody knows about this exploit, and it's dangerous, and it's in the wild, Microsoft released it publicly. So absolutely, yeah. If you're still like, if you have to run XP somewhere for some reason, get those updates installed from Microsoft. It will. It's it's really for your own security and safety. Hey, good. Thanks, thank you. Ancillary question: uh, We have uh, our our latest computer is Windows Seven. That's covered, right? It's automatic updates. Yes. I think that uh, I think Microsoft's still uh, supporting updates for Windows Seven. I'm not a Windows expert, but I think so. And and the funny thing about it is, it used to be you'd hesitate at installing updates because you'd be worried about destabilizing your computer. I feel like the advice has flipped now, where really the answer now is you should install the updates because they're going they're 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 always going to be security things in there, and they're trying to save you from exploits that have been discovered in the wild. So hey, but, last last question. Yeah, sure. You know, we're part of an office. You know, and we get the, the we get our, our our internet service through the the central hub or whatever it is at the office. There's many different offices. If if a virus affects the central hub, is that going to feed over into our computers? What do you, what, what do you think? I think the way viruses are mostly transmitted these days is through attachments and and things like that. And the other exploits are directly on the. Uh, are, are, are other exploits that are coming directly on the network. So it's possible if the central office routers got uh, compromised, they might be able to use those as a beachhead to look at your computers. I am not a security expert. Um, okay. It's a scary world out there. Uh, everything is a potential point of vulnerability. I was reading today about how the, there are all sorts of different uh, uh, Wi-Fi wi routers in people's houses that have had uh, have cracks made for them that allow spying on it by governments. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 tough. So I just say be careful out there and keep uh, keep running the updates. And I think that's all we can do for now. Thanks for your call. It's a scary world out there. I, I I mean I like to give good advice about this, but be afraid is not great advice. It's just the world we live in now. Let's uh, take another call. James in Riverside has a question. James, hello. Hi. How are you? I'm Thank doing great. You. Thanks for calling. Uh, my question is about the, you know what the sidebar is when you open in column view, you have a sidebar on your windows and they've taken the color out of that for a number of years and it drives me crazy. I don't understand why they would ever do that. And if they wanted to do that, why not make it a preference instead of forcing you into looking at, uh, 
black and white. <laughs> what? So what? Yeah. yeah, I'm not quite sure what you're saying here. What? Um, what sidebar are you talking about? The, the sidebar when you open a window, you have a sidebar on it. Is this like in the Finder on a, on a Mac? Yeah. yeah. Okay. On a Mac. On a Mac. You're a Mac expert. Yes. So yes, sir. <laughs> and when you open it up, you I used to have colored icons. Uh, couple of years ago. Oh, yeah. And Apple decided to fix it. Uh, of course, it wasn't broken, but they decided to fix it anyway, and they took the color out of it. Why? I have no idea. Yeah. You're, no, you're right. Um, the two, the, uh, the menu bar, too, used to be more color, colorful, and now it's not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, my computer is powerful enough to do it, but uh, it's just I don't understand how they're fixing something that wasn't broken. Well, I, I think as with the people out there who who listen to Leo frequently, who uh, enjoy it when he rants about Apple a little bit, I, I just got to kind of, they're going to enjoy this one too, which is Apple decided somewhere, some designer in Cupertino decided that it would be really nice if their um, their monochrome design or their you know their shades of gray design in the Finder sidebar was all consistent, and that custom icons would uh, were were messing things up, and they wanted it to just be consistent and black and white, and so that they basically said, "This is what it looks like now. We're going to get rid of this. Doesn't it look so much nicer?" And you know, as a default, maybe most people think it looks nicer, but what they also did was basically take away your ability to. Uh, to personalize your own computer. And I, I don't know what to say beyond that's Apple. Like they do stuff like this sometimes and sometimes there's pushback and they give you the power back again. But this seems to be one of those areas where they just decided they didn't want to let you dress up that part of your Mac anymore. So they took it away. Yeah, I need to bang the guy overhead with a stupid stick. Yeah, so you would, dra would you drag like folders and, uh, that had icons and stuff or, or even apps into that sidebar? I keep on the sidebar, I keep programs that I use like once a month, but now all of them have the same icon on them, which is just an organic icon. Right, the generic application icon. Right, right. And so I have to stand there and look at it and go, oh, and I number of times I've clicked the wrong one because I, I didn't get the right one. So, you know, and, so why, why are you using the Finder sidebar for that and not like the dock? Because I've got a lot of things in my dock. I must have 40 programs in it. Yeah, all right. I'm going to give you a, a, an app recommendation. It's a little bit old, but you might like it. It's called Drag Thing. And Drag you thing. can go to dragthing.com. It is by my friend James Thompson, who is I have known for 20 years. I reviewed Drag Thing 1.0 20 years ago for Mac User Magazine. Oh, my God. Um, and you might like it. It is a dock that you can put things in. James actually worked on the Mac OS X dock for a little while. Um, and, and he also wrote this program. And it lets you, uh, they can, they, you can put a little tab on it and have it pop out. I don't know whether it'll solve your issue or not, but you might want to just see if maybe you could set up a, a Drag Thing dock somewhere where your dock isn't. Put more of your apps in there and um, stop using the Finder sidebar for it. And I, I have some good news for you: the you can control the size of the icons and drag thing. You can have their names or not have their names. You can control the color of the dock. You can have multiple docked folders. Um, it's actually really nice. And if you're launching a bunch of apps that are important to you, um, even whether it's 20 or it's five. Um, and you want a little more customizability, maybe something like Drag Thing would work better than trying to force the Finder to do what Apple doesn't want it to do anymore. I, I don't know if it'll work with the way you work, but it might just set up another place where you can put a bunch of your stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to definitely try that. Yeah, it's a, it's an older utility, but it still works. James Thompson keeps it updated. Um, he also makes the P-Calc calculator for the Mac and and uh, and for the iPhone and iPad and Apple Watch and every other platform. But Drag Thing was his first uh, piece of software, and it still works great. And I, I still use it. I use it for my servers. I put my servers in there. So if I want to mount a particular volume on our network server, I click on a particular tab and drag thing and pick a server and it opens because it'll do you can throw anything in there you can throw urls in there you can throw apps you can throw folders in there so maybe a third-party utility will will satisfy you more than uh than apple is doing right now yeah uh, well what i can do is try it yeah give it a shot 
There are other apps that do that sort of thing, but DragThing comes to mind because it's the one that I've been using for 20 years. Uh, it's unfortunate that Apple has driven you to this, but there, there may be a, a, another alternative that'll do what you want, which is to get quick access to that stuff you're trying to put in the sidebar. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. Well, thanks for calling. This is the Tech Guy radio show. I am not Leo Laporte. I am Jason Snell. Uh, sitting in for Leo. We're almost at the end, but there's more to come. There's still a little bit more to come. Don't go away. We'll be back after a short break to tell you much, much more about tech problems, tech solutions here on The Tech Guy. By the way, to the live viewers or anybody watching the video, just want to share with you, this is Skeletor on my shirt. It is the cutest Skeletor that you'll ever see. I searched the internet because I wanted an emoji of Skeletor, because I felt like I needed in our um, Slack room to express myself in emoji, but the emotion I wanted to express was Skeletor. And I found this. It's adorable. Um, it's by... Uh, I just found it on the internet somewhere randomly, and I, I used it, and then I decided... Um, just in Slack, and I decided I wanted to do T-shirts. And so I, uh, I emailed the guy who, who, I, who, who posted it on the internet, and I said, did you make this? And he said, yeah. I said, I'll cut you in. Let's do T-shirts. And we did. And so now I have a Skeletor T-shirt. It's great. Some stickers, too. So, yeah, Sybil in the chat room, you can use Spotlight as a launcher as well. You know, here's the thing. If you're so committed to the idea of seeing a list of the things you want to click on your apps that you would drag them into the Finder sidebar... My gut, I'm gonna, my gut feeling was that let's find something really similar to that where he can make a list somewhere of those apps with those icons, with some color, and have it be there for him uh, rather than saying, you know, you can use uh, Spotlight to launch apps. Um, you're right. I could have mentioned that. But I just got the sense that he would be using Spotlight if he was thinking about it. And he wasn't thinking about it. So <laughs> my, my thing, you know, sometimes people like to do the way they want to do it. Some people never use Spotlight. Some, you know, some people never search anywhere. And other people, all they do is search. Like their whole interface they do is search. Some people will launch apps by opening the Finder, opening the Applications folder, scrolling, and double-clicking. And other people will use Spotlight or Launch Bar or something like that. Anyway, drag thing might work for him. It might not. But he could probably replicate his... He really cares about those colorful icons. Maybe that'll do it for him. He could even turn off the sidebar at that point if he wanted to. This Skeletor is made out of um, here. It turns out I didn't notice this. It's just, it's really simple. It's like two dots, and then that's a heart upside down. It's just a heart symbol upside down. It's adorable. It's a Skeletor. I had to do it on a black shirt because you got to get the black of the shadow of the hood and then purple and yellow. Anyway, it's Skeletor. He's the cutest Skeletor is what I'm saying. One of these days, Skeletor will be an official emoji. It's probably not going to happen, but hooded skeleton. No brand names. Hooded skeleton. Lots of yellow skeletons could wear purple hoodies. What? It's not a big deal. All right. We are reaching the end. It's very exciting. Just a little bit left to go, people. And then I will walk out into the 100 degree heat <laughs> and wish everybody a happy Father's Day one more time. The Tech Guy live on a Sunday. Jason Snell sitting in for Leo Laporte answering your technology questions to my best ability, trying my best to answer your problems if I can. Let's go to Casey in Orange County. Casey, hello. Welcome to the Tech Guy. Thanks, Jason. Um, I've got an iPhone 7 that um, uh, I need to be replaced. Originally, I bought it from my carrier, and it was actually Apple that replaced it for me. And to activate it, um, I needed Wi-Fi, and my carrier doesn't offer that. So my friend, because I have a disability, she went down to... Public Wi-Fi at a Starbucks activated it, and next thing I get an email from Apple saying that someone accessed the iCloud using my Apple ID, and um, I let Apple know, well, yeah, that wasn't me, based on the info they provided me, um, and literally, like, 24 hours before I had a chance to change my password, I opened it up, um, YouTube, the homepage, and I'm real consistent in what I what videos I choose, and then I 
uh, it's usually music videos and some others, and then uh, YouTube, you know, will will provide me new videos that are relatable. I opened it up, and 100% of what I was seeing was gaming. Like, like there must have been at least 30 um, videos. The, the way the format is set up, you can just mm-hmm. scan, and um, they were averaging like either live or an hour to two hours long, and um, there was nothing related to me. So um, um, I, I didn't, I didn't touch it. I, I changed my password, um, and it took about almost a week for the videos to slowly go away and my videos to come back. And when I checked with Apple, he didn't, the tech support didn't think that I had been hacked. He thought that it wasn't, I wasn't in sync with uh, YouTube somehow and Virgin Mobile because I was concerned about my data for one thing. And they're saying, oh, there's no problem and it won't affect your data. So um, I knew, let's see, 13 days after I got these new videos, um, I got a message that I used up 85% of my data. Mm. I hadn't even been using YouTube because I I literally left it alone to see what was going to happen. And I didn't want to click on anything and attempt to get rid of these videos. I didn't want the system to think that I'm, I'm like choosing. Right. I just, I literally let it, it literally slowly, I'd see like 20% of mine coming back. And, and like I said, it took almost a week for literally all these videos to go away and mine to come back. So once I got the, the message that I used up most of my data and which I, I don't get those notices right. to maybe one or two days before the end of the month, um, um, I, I went back to my carrier and said, uh, and thankfully they gave me a couple of weeks um, free um, and they they just asked, does everything else seem to be working? I said, yeah. Um, there hasn't been anything else that I've seen happen differently. Do you think, especially since you're an Apple person, do you think that the changing of the password and the way this seems to have gone down, do you think I'm safe at this point? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I think there are a lot of different things going on here, and I think there may be um, more... Uh, different things happening that that it's it's important to not view as happening um, all because of the same reason. The login uh, with your Apple ID is possible that there was confusion. I've seen Apple ID logins that were ha- that were happening that looked like they were the wrong place and that they weren't. But it's possible that that somebody guessed your password and you changed it. The thing is, that you're logging into an Apple ID shouldn't actually affect what you see on YouTube. So it's possible that if you had if you had a new phone, that it does actually take time if you're not lo- if you're not logged in to uh, train YouTube about what you are interested in. It's also possible that somebody logged into your Google account if you've got one, and that was what was happening that was adjusting your YouTube preferences. But your Apple ID itself shouldn't have an impact on it. Um, A lot of times the YouTube stuff will be based on your device, especially if you're not logged in to YouTube. So that that may be something you're seeing there. Uh, I'm skeptical about whether those two things are connected. You could always change your YouTube or Google password if you wanted, but sometimes the recommendations just kind of go away if it doesn't know who you are and it starts to make generic recommendations, or if it thinks you're a device that it's seen before, but it wasn't. Um, that that can also happen. I think the place that, in terms of um, your cellular usage, the thing to check out is if you go in the settings app and under cellular, uh, down at the bottom, there will be cellular data usage, and you can actually scroll, and you will get data usage for every app. Not only can you turn cellular usage off per app, um, and you can turn off a thing down at the bottom called Wi-Fi Assist, which will sometimes, even when you're on Wi-Fi, if your Wi-Fi is bad, it will switch over and use cellular data, which is super dangerous. And then at the very bottom, there's a reset statistics button. So if it's giving you statistics for a year, you can reset it to zero and then watch and see what apps are using your your data, because that will tell you whether some Something on your phone is using data because so you should be your phone should be the only device on your carrier, and so ideally, um, you know, if your phone's not using it, it's not like somebody with your Apple ID is suddenly able to use your cellular data. It shouldn't work like that either. So I would check 
all of those things out. Um, and uh, and I, I wish you good luck, but I think that they may be three separate issues, believe it or not, and not related. And I think changing your Apple ID is a good first step to uh, getting away from the pop problem of that being uh, that being a, uh, potentially uh, subverted by somebody. So I would I would consider changing your Google account a password if you've got it, and um, looking at that cellular usage screen. Okay. I mean, just one real quick question on the cellular data um, usage um, under settings. Okay, I don't have Wi-Fi at all. I don't have. I don't. All right. Oh, it's. Well, so you're gonna yeah. you're gonna be using cellular data. So the, the the real question is gonna be, you just want to look and see, and if there is a particular app that you're using that's using a lot of cellular data, at least you'll know, and you can actually even turn it off and just ban it from using data, and uh, or you could delete the app if it's one of those. But I, I definitely recommend you look there if you're having data overages. We have just enough time for one final call, and it is Stephen in Hemet, California. Stephen, hi. We only have a moment. What's your question? We'll get it in quick. Sure. sure. Thanks for taking the call. My question is uh, uh, an iPod. I'm at my father's. I'm trying to get it to, to pair with his Wi-Fi and putting the correct PIN numbers in, but it, it's being stubborn. It won't, it won't let me in on the, on the Wi-Fi side. Yeah, uh, sometimes I've seen this where where there's a, a particular Wi-Fi base station that is really cranky, especially about Apple stuff. Um, and I don't have a, a surefire answer. I hate to be the person who does this to you, but I feel like the uh, the best things to try are uh, restart the iPod. If that doesn't work, you might even want to do the um, in the settings app, do a reset the network settings and and have it restart, and then see if it'll connect. Then you might also want to try unplugging. Um, the base station and replugging it in and letting it just do a reboot because sometimes that's all it takes is to get everybody back on equal footing and then it'll connect. Um, okay. But I can't guarantee it because sometimes that happens, but it's worth a shot. Great. Thanks for the, thanks for taking my call. Thank you for calling. Well, that brings us to the end of the tech guy. It's been a three hour crazy ride for me. Thank you so much to Leo and all the gang here for letting me sit in for him. I really appreciate it. You can read more that I write at sixcolors.com and listen to me at theincomparable.com or relay.fm. Thanks. Leo will be back next week. You've been listening to the tech guy. Well, that's it for the tech guy show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows on the Netcast Network. It's called TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. You even get your daily dose of tech news with Tech News Today. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, this Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.